Good evening. Um, welcome to the December 12, 2019 uh, school committee meeting. Our chair, Mr. Robinson, is stuck in traffic and has reached out and asked if I would start the meeting. We would typically wait a couple extra minutes, but we have some high school staff here tonight that we're very excited to hear from who have a concert that they need to get to at 7 o'clock. So we want to make sure that they're able to do that. So we are actually going to start the meeting. We will start as we always do with public comment. We will do the consent agenda. Um, I'm going to push reports to the end of the meeting to help our staff get through and continue with their schedule, um, with the exception of our student who is here tonight. So we can't wait to hear your report. We'll let you go first. And then we're gonna dive into the presentation. The main points of tonight's agenda are a presentation from our high school principal and director of guidance um, on um, the school, um, the guidance and college and um, some information about um, the handbook. Very excited to hear from them. So first, I will ask if anyone is here tonight to participate in public comment. Seeing none, uh, I would like to move on to the consent agenda. I do believe Dr. Doherty, before, we, um, before I ask if anyone wants anything removed, I think Dr. Doherty had a comment on something. Yeah, there was a couple of questions that uh, individual school committee members had sent me regarding the, the wrestling field trip, so I just want to clarify it so it's not doesn't have to be pulled out. Um, so the the first of all, there are currently 17 uh, students on the wrestling team. Um, I believe the application said a different number. Um, the 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 two adults that would be going on the bus transportation would be the coach, uh, the head coach, and the assistant wrestling coach um, so and they have been quarried they've been fingerprinted those are they're all um, you know as part of uh, any of the employee verification and check system that we do for all of our employees so um, I wanted to make sure I clarified that and our bus transportation uh, is for athletics is North Suburban okay. thank you Dr. Doherty does anyone want to remove anything from the consent agenda tonight I move to approve the consent agenda. Second. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Wise. All those in favor? It passes 5-0. Thank you. Um, Maura, would love to hear what's going on <laughs> as we approach the winter break. Right. OK, so our MHS students have been working so hard these last few weeks, volunteering, participating in community-wide events, getting accepted into college. The community has a lot to be proud about. So first off, this is going back a little bit, but we haven't met for a while, so Touchdown Tuesday. This was on November 26. This is a senior girls versus junior, years, junior girls flag football game, this, which was at the high school at nighttime. It's coached by the varsity football team who, you know, the junior boys will help coach the junior girls and the senior boys will help coach the senior girls. And it gets very competitive. The senior girls won, so go seniors. And we had, this was a real community event. We had real refs there, the singing group, the RMHS select choir sing there. We had the Reading Rocket actually did make an appearance. We had the Reading Rocket, the Snack Shack was open, the stands were full. So this was a great opportunity for members from throughout the different schools, different age groups to come together and have a wonderful fun time before Thanksgiving. We also have the next day, the pep rally. So this is an annual tradition, always the whole school meets. And this is another community unifying event. We had the cheerleaders performing, the RMHS merit scholars. So people who are at the top of the PSATs, they were honored. We had captains of all the teams honored. Presidents of different clubs were there. The bands performed. There was a tug of war between the different grades. So again, another unifying event to help establish everyone being thankful before the hol um, holiday season and Thanksgiving would begin. We also had students volunteering at the tree lighting, which was that weekend, December 1st. So at the tree lighting, we had over 30 RMHS students volunteering. They dressed up as characters. They helped run the events. And we also had the RMHS marching band performing. So the R we ought to give it to the RMHS marching band. They were performing at the football game. They were performing at the pep rally, Touchdown Tuesday, the, even at the tree lighting. So they've been working so hard. And then today, there's been a lot going on. We had the DECA field trip. So DECA, this is their first year. They're a club, an association of high schools across America, preparing emerging leaders in marketing, finance, hospitality, and management. So today, 10 RMHS students went to a competition, it was a districts, and they were presented with a business problem and had to propose a solution, which was judged. And 
five students here were received medals, which means that RMHS is going to go to states. So this was really exciting. This was their first year. And, uh, and this was their first year too, so that was phenomenal. And they're going to do great at states. Just know it. And then also tonight, as we mentioned, we have the chorus concert at 7 o'clock here at the PAC. So students in a variety of singing groups, we have the singers, the select choir, and the um, mixed choir who have been arranging music and preparing for months. So that's today. Maybe you can head on over to that, or there might be a recording, but they are very excited for that. This is their annual winter song fest. So thank you. Thank you so much for thank that you. report. <laughs> Such good news. <laughs> Um, I'm going to put, uh, put off all the rest of the reports until later in the meeting, and I will turn it over to Dr. Doherty to introduce your staff. Yes. Uh, we'd like to have uh, Linda Williams, our Director of Guidance in Cape Boynton, our high school principal, going to um, give some updates. Linda's going to give uh, the college admissions data that she has done annually. Um, and then Kate's going to give some updates on some of the initiatives that are going on here at Reading Memorial High School. So I'm going to turn it over to Linda. Thank you for having me. I think this is my fourth year doing this, third or fourth year. Um, and so those of you who have seen this presentation, um, you've heard me say every year that I really do think that I have the best job in the school. I think there's nothing more rewarding than helping kids in a whole variety of ways, but particularly helping them to get to the next phase of their life. This presentation's coming at a, at a very, it's timely because within the next few weeks, um, well, actually, within the next few days, <laughs> um, many students are gonna be hearing from colleges, from students who have applied early decision, early action. So this is an extremely exciting time. At the same time, I wanna acknowledge for those families that are out there, this is also a stressful time. Um, so hopefully we have some great news that's coming our way. Um, but I think it's also important for those of you in the community who um, have seniors, the holidays can be a really exciting time when they're sharing great news with their families, but then it's also the, the time when a lot of students get asked, so what are your plans next year, when many of them aren't going to hear until many months um, from now. So it's, it's a stressful but exciting time. So I'm going to walk you through the data from last year's class. There's a lot of great um, information, not too many changes from past years, but um, I'm going to walk you through what we have. All right, so last year's class had 320 students. 87% um, went to four-year colleges. That's a slightly down from um, the year um, before that, slightly like 3%. Um, Two-year colleges, 7.5%, um, where um, the class right before that, it was just 1% um, lower than that. Prep and tech schools, um, relatively the same. I think the year before that was at like 0.6. Um, and then 4.4% for students who um, are doing other things. Um, and that's a whole variety of things. That could be gap years, it could be them working, there's a whole variety of different things. Our goal last year was to get as close as possible to 100% of our students um, having a solid plan when they left, and we were pretty close to it. I will say that the students who didn't know were telling us like where they are working, if they ended up working there, we're, we're not exactly sure, but many of them, um, when they didn't have a plan for college, were telling us um, where they were planning to work or um, what activity they were gonna do after high school. So where our students go as far as the college piece? Um, they went to 103 different four-year colleges. Now, they applied to many more than that, but where they actually went was 103 different ones. Majority of them stay in the New England area um, with 76%. 59% of those 76 stayed in Massachusetts and 27% um, of the Massachusetts, the students who stayed in Massachusetts went to um, a public at state university or college. 7% um, went off to New York and then the, the rest was 16% um, went outside of um, New England. And I'm not sure why it says New York in there. That's a typo on my part. I should have deleted that, so I apologize. Right. So I realized when I started doing this, like we had um, 
eight or nine years in here, but really I think it's important just for us to focus on the last few years. Um, so the number of applications, it fluctuates all over the place. Um, we're right where, last year's class is right where I would expect them to be. If you notice um, in the first section, the year before that was down, but we had a significantly less number of students in that class. I think we were at 269 compared to 320. Yeah. Yeah. So that's really going to make the difference um, when you're looking at these charts. The number of colleges, relatively the, sl the same, percent accepted, relatively the same. Um, early decision, um, that's really how many applied early decision. Um, again, relatively the same. The early actions went up um, last year, but again, that's because of the number of students in the class. Percentage-wise, it's all relatively um, the same from years past. So I always like to go over this because I know um, there's so many people who might be watching this at home and I think this is important for us just to remember the things that go into the criteria that admissions counselors are looking for. Of course there's the academic piece, you know, they are looking at the transcript, the level of classes that the students are taking, the GPA, the decile rank, um, but they're looking at so much more and what we're hearing from so many colleges that are coming to visit us as well as when we're going out visiting colleges and the college fair, um, they're more colleges are going into that holistic view of the student. It's not just about the data that the students are bringing with their stats. Um, they care about what are their extracurricular activities? Do they have a part-time job? Have they traveled? What clubs are they in? Um, of course, there's the standardized tests um, that they're looking at, but to be honest with you, every year the number of schools that are going test optional is increasing, um, which is a, a big relief to many of our students because so many of them do well in their classes but really struggle with the standardized test. Um, and I think that it's kind of a relief for them knowing that colleges are looking at it more of a holistic um, approach as opposed to just um, numbers. And the additional information, the essays are really important. Um, I'm going to talk about that a little bit um, towards the end when I'm talking about things that we're doing to help students in the process. Um, the recommendations, I'll also um, address that at the end. Um, there's interviews that many colleges um, have students go on, but there's also the informational interviews um, where students can go and get information and just meet with an admissions rep just, just so they can learn about the school, which is a n nice opportunity for them to get on campus and um, learn more about the school. They want to know what honors and awards kids are getting. The demonstrated interest over the years has definitely been something that more and more colleges are tracking. But what we have kind of found is when we started telling kids that, I think they were going, some were making it a real point to make sure that the college knew every time that they um, contacted the college or went to a college fair, which is important. I'm a little bit worried, um, and this is not just a Reading thing, this is, you know, when I was talking about it at the Middlesex Guidance Directors meeting, I think this is a thing that it's starting to add a little bit of stress onto the kids, so I think we just have to kind of think about how we reword this and phrase this for the students so they're not so overly stressed. My goal is to help kids get to the next phase, but I want to do that in a way that is the least stressful for the kids. So our process over the years has slightly changed where we have spread out so much of what we're asking the students to do so they're not doing so much senior year. It's a big chunk is junior year, then over the summer, then senior year. We have a plan for them and if they kind of follow that plan, it's not so overwhelming. Of course, the stress of, of just thinking about the next phase of life, that is stressful, but the actual logistics of doing things, that's what we've been trying to spread out so it's not so overwhelming for them. Um, and for s students who are interested in dance or music or art, you know, there are portfolios and auditions that they need to do. Um, one of the things that we have been talking as a guidance department is not only giving this information to students and helping them understand what the colleges are looking for, but also what they should be looking in for a, a college. Um, but one of the things that we've been talking about is how do we help them um, 
have the most solid application. And so I think part of what we're going to be doing when we're starting to work with juniors is not only giving them this information, but helping them figure out who are they and how do they want to represent themselves in the application. Because it's not just about numbers. It's not just what's written in the application. We want to make their application come alive so the admissions um, officers don't just see it as a piece of paper, but they see them as like a real person behind this. Um, so we're going to be working with them in our developmental guidance classes on those types of things. So the SATs, um, so there's a little um, thing at the bottom that the new format of the SATs was in 2017. And so I took out the data. I only kept it to the three years because when you look at the data over the last five years, there's a, there's a difference in the scores. And that's simply because of the change in the SAT. So I just kept the data to um, the last three years. And I changed it up this year um, compared to last year's because I wanted to show you the percent of test takers um, as opposed to just the number. So we are remaining consistent the last um, three years where 94 percent um, of our students are taking the SATs and the scores are relatively the same over the last um, few years. Um, PSATs, I don't have a slide as far as the PSATs but we had a big increase in the number of students Last year, we did it on a Wednesday where um, all sophomores and juniors took the PSATs. This year, we moved it to a Saturday, um, back to the Saturday. That's where we originally did it. I was pleased to say, I'm pleased to say that we still had a really high number of students. Um, a little bit overwhelming, I'm going to admit, as the PSAT coordinator, finding the, the um, proctors for 400 and something students. Um, but it worked out, and um, we got everyone and there was uh, still a pretty high number of sophomores that were taking it compared to when we did it a few years ago on a Saturday. Um, what I want to emphasize to the families is um, on our new website, which I will talk about in a minute, there is a piece on there that talks about, and we go over this with parents during all of the parent nights, um, when is the best time to take the SATs, the PSATs and the SATs, and so I just want to make sure that parents know that sophomore year, the PSATs is really the practice to the practice of the SATs. It's the junior year we really want students to take their, the PSATs. So for all the parents out there that had their sophomores take it this year, we want to make sure that they're also taking the PSATs next year. In the ACTs, this is a little bit, I, I don't have an answer for this one because the number of students in the class has grown, but if you look at the third column, the number of test takers, the percentage has decreased. Um, that could be so many different reasons. I know in 2017, the number jumped up pretty high that year. I think that's, uh, there's a simple reason for that. It's because the College Board changed the SATs. So that particular year, um, I think people panicked and they wanted to go with a test that had been around for a long time that didn't have changes. So I think that's where the number went up. I would have expected the number to stay um, relatively the same, but gradually over the years, um, it keeps going down. It's still advertised just as much. I think the ACTs are a great test for students to try out. The benefit of taking both the SATs and the ACTs, um, if you do better on one of the tests, well, then that's what you submit to the schools. Um, if you take the ACTs and you don't do so well, nobody knows that except for the student, the parent, and their guidance counselor. Um, so um, I think for students, um, it's great. It's a great option to take both. I also will, just what I said earlier, more and more students or schools are going test optional. So I think students are also weighing, why am I paying the money? Why am I spending time? It's not really fun to be taking a standardized test. So I think it's, it, this is not just a Reading thing. I think it's um, happening in many districts. Um, the AP participation. Um, so you'll notice that two years ago um, there was the dip down to 198, but then it went back up to um, 244 last year. Again, that had a lot to do with the graduating class where it was smaller before. Um, there has been a shift in the um, 
the AP test, we have a lot more students who are taking classes than are actually taking the test. I think that's a whole variety of reasons. One, um, the tests are expensive. It's $100. Um, that there, we charge just a little bit more so we can pay for proctors and just the logistics of the um, administering the exam. But College Board, I think it's like $95 or something that College Board is charging. So I think it's expensive. I think we have students who are taking multiple courses. And I think, especially for seniors, they're weighing out do I really need to take all four exams? What are my, what's my college going to accept if I do really well? And so more, there are colleges, there's a website that specifically states what the colleges will accept. And so we're telling the kids, like, if you don't want to spend four or $500, look to see what your college is, is going to accept, especially for your particular major. Um, so I think there's that piece. We also kind of changed our policy um, just to make it more fair to students um, and not favoring just the people who wanted to pay. So a few years ago, the policy was that if you took the AP tests, you didn't have to take the final exam, um, which is really great for students. <laughs> um, but we had a few students kind of question that policy. And it definitely made us start thinking about, like, there are kids who might choose to pay to take the exam so they don't have to take our final exam, when there are other students who don't have the $100 to pay to take this AP exam that they don't necessarily care about. They're not going to get credit, but they just don't want to take our final exam. And so we want to be fair to everyone. We don't want to just cater to the people who have the money who can buy their way out of taking a final exam. And so um, we, saw, we saw a dip. And I'm okay, I'm okay with that dip if that is the reason. I'm okay with the dip if it's because their college is not going to accept the exam. I will say that the recommendation that we are giving for juniors is that if you're in an AP course, um, we're recommending that you take the exam. If they do well, that's part of their admissions packet. If they don't do well, nobody sees it except for them, their parents, the school. Um, you'll see it on this slide, but it's not being sent to colleges. So it's kind of, um, they're paying the money for it, but if they do well, there's, there's the added benefit that can help them in the admissions process. Um, this year, College Board changed the process. A little bit stressful in the guidance office. I'm not going to deny that, not just for us, but just about every guidance department in the country. Um, in the past, the registration for the exams was in March. And so kids would have most of the school year to see how they're doing in the class and make a decision if they want to take the exam. College Board changed that this year. They wanted everybody to register by November 15th. Not only did they... Um, and, and not only did they need to register, um, but they also needed to register through College Board for the class. So there's been multiple steps to get kids to register for the College Board piece of the class, but then register for the exam, and then give me a separate payment. Um, so it's been a little bit, um, a little bit stressful making sure that all the kids are signed up. College Board also not only had the students register, it's um, if they registered and then they decide that they don't want to take it later, there's a $40 cancellation fee. If they don't register by November 15th and they decide later that they want to register, there's a $40 late fee. Um, so either way, there's, there's, there's fees. <laughs> um, so there, it was kind of, it was, it was a little bit stressful, um, October, November, with the, the change and kids wanting advice. Um, we got everybody who wanted to register is registered. But even to this date, we're having students come to me saying, um, I'm not really sure if I made the right decision. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how it plays out the rest of the, rest of the year. 
This is the AP recognition um, that um, we get every year, depending on how our students do. So there's the AP scholars, which um, for this year we had 31 students who scored um, either a three or higher on three or more exams. We had 14 students who were AP scholars with honors, which is the 3.25 score or higher um, on three or four exams. And then the AP scholars with distinction is a 3.5 um, for three um, or more exams. So our numbers, um, you know, it's not, not a surprise that we went up because we also had more students taking it too. So. All right, and this is the last slide. This is the part that I, although I love talking about all of it, I like this, this slide because we get to share the things that we're doing. Um, so this year we increased the number of um, colleges that came to visit us. We had 100 college, colleges come to the guidance office. So our office was definitely buzzing with lots of meetings with seniors. So these are opportunities for students to meet with the admissions reps that are going to be reviewing their applications. Um, and so it's just another opportunity for students to have contact um, with the admissions counselor. It's another opportunity for them to also learn about schools that maybe they hadn't considered before, um, but they maybe over the summer decided they wanted to look at other opportunities and meeting with their guidance counselor. So this is a good way for them to get information. So I think last year we were at 70, this year we're at 100. Um, it definitely takes more time to do that because college reps want to meet with the guidance counselors too. So that's part of um, what we were doing this, this fall. We switched our college fair. It used to always be in October, but this year we switched it to April, and it's really to accommodate more of the sophomores and juniors. Our, the admissions process has really shifted pretty significantly. I've been doing this over 20 years, and I can remember over winter break is when I'd be, I used to write a lot of recommendations and didn't have much of a winter break, and then it kind of shifted to Thanksgiving, um, where I'm writing a lot of recommendations then to meet the December 1st deadline. Now it's like November 1st. Seniors are coming in, majority of seniors, I'm not going to say all of them, majority of seniors are coming in senior year having a good sense of where they want to apply. So a college fair in October <coughs> seems late for um, seniors, but it seems a little bit too early for the sophomores and juniors. So it's a cooperative college fair with eight other high schools. Um, so the guidance directors and I, we all got together to talk about it, and we decided to make two changes. One, move it to April. Um, so the invitations to the colleges um, are going out very soon, um, but I think it's going to, I think we're going to increase the turnout as far as families. Um, and then we're also going to add a career component to it and hoping to get more um, opportunities for students who might not be thinking about a four-year school, but are are looking at the trades, looking at other technical schools, and trying to increase um, that for some of our students who are just looking for options. Um, the third bullet I'm really excited about, this is the gap year fair that's coming um, on January 12th. Um, I don't know if you guys are aware of what gap years are, but they're organized programs. There's so many throughout the country. It's an opportunity for students to um, be involved with an organized group, and they can do a whole variety of different things. There's service um, gap year programs, there's traveling. Um, it's a way for them to take a break in between high school and college and to explore the whole world that is out there. There's some right here in Boston, but then they can go to other parts of the country, other parts of the world. There's so many great things. In my previous school, there were um, many students who did gap years, and all of them came back more mature, more excited, with a passion, and ready to go off to school. Whereas before, it was they, some of them were super stressed just about the workload that they had with um, college, or they weren't necessarily ready to go off and spend fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars when they didn't exactly know what they wanted to do with college. So this is a nice opportunity. Um, the best part about it is that I don't have to really plan all that much. The gap year program does it all. They're just working with me, but they, um, they're doing a lot of the work. So we're providing the facility here. Um, so I'm excited for that. 
We're continuing with our flex block um, senior seminars. We're going to be at the advice of the um, seniors, because at the end of the year they have to fill out a senior survey, um, and we get feedback on how we're doing and what they think that they could have used more of. And many seniors felt that they would like for us to follow up with them in the spring. And although we were thinking like, we talked to so many of these kids in the spring, I wonder what they're thinking. When we dug a little bit deeper and talked to the kids who actually commented on that, it was more of like, look, we're, we're getting ready to go off and we don't know what we don't know. And we just kind of felt like there was something else. So um, that is one of the things that we're building in um, another opportunity to make sure we're touching base with all the seniors um, in a flex block. Um, increased number of juniors. So this is um, the APs. So we increased the number of juniors that can take AP US history. Um, last year was the first year um, that we offered the AP language and composition, and that um, was very successful. And this is our first year offering AP government. So I'm excited when you look at the last, you know, seven years since I've been here, we used to be very heavy in the math and science, and I'm, I'm proud to say that we have a nice variety of um, AP offerings. Um, because, let's face it, like, Good. Not everybody is interested in math and science, yeah. and um, just to be able to have other opportunities for them is great. The revised, um, I, I wrote in the second to last bullet, we have a revised college essay in the um, English class. So my um, goal was that I wanted to make sure that every student had some opportunity to be working on their college essay and have some guidance um, from their English teacher. So working with them, um, we have... Um, and it, I will say that I will give credit to the English teachers who have been working on this over the years, but Audra really made sure that now every student is um, accessing this, or not accessing it, it, will have this instruction in their English class. But there's not a clear lesson on the college essay. And the reason for that is that we don't want to stress the kids out. We want them to be writing about themselves and writing about a variety of different things without this stress of, this is my college essay, it has to be perfect and stuff. So they are going to be working on these essays throughout the entire year. I think it's like the alphabet. I, I, there's a title to it, and I should have asked before coming here tonight. What's it called? Encyclopedia. Yeah. So it's. So did you do this? I did it. It was yeah. very. It was so helpful. Yeah. Because going into the summer, we basically already had it done. So right. it was a weight off our shoulders going into the application process. Yeah. Definitely. So basically, they're writing like 20 different essays um, over the course of the year, and it's all alphabet based. Yeah. But it's things that are pertaining to them. So it really fits what the colleges are looking for. But they have 20 essays that they get to look back on and kind of choose which one do they want it enhance even more and use that for the college essay. So I actually, I think that is a, a brilliant way to do it. It makes sure that all students at all levels are covering it. Um, so that is something that they have committed to um, for this year. Um, and the last point I mention, um, this isn't specific to guidance because guidance counselors write college recommendations for every student that is applying to a four-year or a two-year school that requires it. Um, that's part of our job, even though we might do it at home or we might do it on the side. Um, but for the teachers, it is not. And I just want to highlight the, the great work that the teachers are doing when they're going above and beyond um, their regular, um, the expectations of teaching their classes. We had 69 teachers write um, one or more recommendations last year. So this is per student. This is not one like student having 10 colleges that they're applying to. They're writing um, for all of our different seniors. So 69 teachers wrote recommendations. 13 teachers wrote 20, between 20 and upwards of 58 recommendations. <clears throat> that is a lot of time, a lot of re recommendations. Um, and they're all unique. I, I read many of them. There's a lot of effort that's put into the letters of recommendation. And I really just want to highlight um, that piece because I think it's important for people to know that um, it's not part of their job, but it's just one more way that the teachers are helping students get to the next phase of their life. So that's my presentation. I don't know if there's any questions. Any, yes, John.
Do you see students accessing their, their college visitation days more or less now um, through the school year? Um, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't particularly track that. We let them know that there are four days between their junior and senior year that they um, get to use as academic days to go visit. Um, that goes through the office and attendance. I don't know the data. I just hear a lot of kids visiting colleges, but I, I haven't tracked the specific number of that. But that, that's a good question that I can look into. Linda, thank you for this. Uh, I just had a question on the uh, uh, tests they standardized. So I had heard I had heard over the years, in recent years, that uh, you know some. Well, you mentioned the the test optional. They don't. Some schools don't care any as much anymore. But I had heard that. In fact, one of the schools where my son, one of my sons, applied was more interested in the ACT than the SAT and uh, is that true or is that uh... I haven't heard that schools are more interested in the I guess it depends on where in the country they're located um, I would say that most schools are accepting both um, but I haven't heard specifically that schools are saying we want more we're looking more at the ACT versus the SAT but if there's a particular college that your son applied to I'd be curious because I'd like to have a conversation with them just to make sure that because um, every year let's face it like as many as people say like oh Lena we really trust you you're the expert in this you can't be an expert in the college admissions because it's constantly changing so <laughs> I can look into that well, I just more. think yeah. in terms of you know you, your point earlier families have limited resources mm -hmm. and, and uh, that they should be putting it towards one versus the other. Yeah. The other yeah. question I had, and this may be for John or Gail, uh, on the AP fee, do we, is that, make that part of the, the scholarship programs we use for, for, for if someone can't, uh, can't pay the $100 or uh, that we what? use for other things like athletics where we can, I don't want to turn somebody away because they can't pay the, the fee to take I, them. I will say before you answer that, and I should have said this earlier, I apologize. Anybody who is on free or reduced lunch um, pays significantly less in the state helps pay for that. College board reduces their fee. We reduce our fee. Um, it's when they're not on the free or reduced lunch, um, that's when it gets a little bit hard. And so I, um, it hasn't been the experience that I have had, but I, I am always open to help. <laughs> yeah, we don't have to okay. answer that tonight, but I uh, just, I would want people to know that they can come to somebody if they can't afford it. Well, the difference, this is run by college boards, whereas athletics extracurricular, that's our budget. Yeah. So that's the difference. Okay. Go that way. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am plenty of all week. Thank you. Fantastic presentation. I'm thrilled to see the AP courses. Yeah. Um, those those additions are really exciting. Um, I have it's really an idea or a suggestion, and it's maybe a little. I don't know if it's Dr. Doherty or, or maybe you, but every year at high school graduation, I'm so impressed at not only, in some cases, the quality and prestige of some of the colleges and universities our seniors go to, but also the variety. And you see that a little bit in the data, but it's a really impressive list. And I, every year I think I wish this was out in the community more because I think people would be really impressed if they saw how many great schools our students go to. So my sort of thought is to think through maybe this spring, can that be put on the website? Could it be publicized in different ways? Um, because I think a lot of people in the community are aware, but I think a lot of people in the community aren't aware of just just how exciting the future for our graduating seniors is. So that was my. So question. I have good news. Okay. Um, <laughs> that as of today, I should have I should have put this as like one of the actions. Um, 
I think you guys know that we have three new guidance counselors um, in our department. And so there's lots of energy, lots of excitement. Um, and they all bring different strengths and skills. And one of them um, really took the lead to help us with our guidance website. Um, I am going to admit, and I don't know who has worked on our regular website, but it is incredibly difficult to use. Um, and he created a Google site, and so it is now on the guidance website where you can, all the post-secondary stuff is, um, is up there. It is, it's real, I highly suggest taking a look at it at some point when you get a chance. Um, but now that I know how to use it, that's something that's very easy for us to put up and I'll make sure that we have that up there for last year's data. That'd be great. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Dr. Doxter. Thank you. A, a huge thank you for this presentation, but I just get, um, I'm so excited and uh, proud of what is being done by you and our guidance department because I'm listening to you and I'm hearing about how you're and I went to the the presentation last night and heard how students want to be listened to and parents need to connect and I'm hearing from you that you are listening to students and families that you've um, you're very aware of the stress they're under and you're finding optimal times of when to introduce things and at what pace to get through them and being honest about things that um, some that that are really important but fight the status quo like we get kudos for having kids in AP classes but you're not encouraging them and and for them to take the test but you're not encouraging them unless it's right for them. And you're not entering into that competition regardless of the other contextual factors that are, that should be con and need to be considered by families. Can they afford it? Will it help them eventually? Will they really be wanting to not take the course that it exempts them from? <clears throat> and it sounds to me like you're really confronting those things and doing the right thing by our students, not, not jumping into the race to nowhere. And that too, I'm so excited because of the gap year programs. When my kids were here, that really was not happening yet. Mm -hmm. And that race to nowhere was like, oh, where do you go? You know, a two-year school, a four-year school, or don't talk about it. Right. Like, drop off the map. And that was really a gap in what we should have been offering, in my opinion, sorry. But in, in progress, I see that as huge because they don't need to be at that extent of a grown-up at that point. They need to experience and figure out who they are, which you're adding into the English classes, which I just think without the stress of it being the application, which I just think that's ingenious. And I'm so grateful to our English teachers and, and to the guidance. Um, the new options that you've added, combined with the civics that people, the kids will have, now they can follow through if they have an interest and have an AP option mm -hmm. in government. I think that's taking a whole view of our educational system and making sure there's something to aspire to that will link them with internships and options and gap years. And it just all sounds like it ties together to me. Um, and so a huge, huge thank you to the administration and to you guys and the teachers. I do have a question attached to this. So I knew um, it was coming at some point. <laughs> <laughs> well, you answered a lot of the ones I sent yeah. in already. You, thank you, and you didn't get them till today. So, thank you. Um, the question I have is about who has access to our AP and our high class, higher level classes. We've condensed the levels intentionally so that kids aren't stuck in lower levels that can very well perform mm -hmm. in a more challenging environment. So are you seeing a difference in who's accessing the higher level classes and at different supports that they might need um, and 
I'm sorry. <laughs> we're we're going to tag team this this Very this question. It's already listing. Uh, so I'm interested yeah. in who's able to access these things yeah. because kids have different strengths. Yeah. Um, so I did get this question earlier, so I apologize I I that I didn't um, address it in my slides. <laughs> so as far as the AP piece, you know, one of the questions that you had are there. Um, I forgot how you worded, but how many students um, from special ed are taking AP classes and um, our METCO population? Um, and so I wanted to let you know that like College Board doesn't necessarily um, give me, they give me statistics as far as um, number of exams that are taken, not necessarily. I don't have the number of students. Um, what I can tell you just from my own quick of look, going back to my chart last year of like my organizational chart, as far as students with disabilities, um, we had um, 11 students that needed accommodations, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're in special ed. It just means that they have been approved by College Board to receive accommodations. Um, so so some of them are in special ed, some of them have 504s, but I, I can't necessarily give you the number as far as um, specific to special ed. Um, I can tell you that as far as number of exams, um, there are 66 um, exams were taken by students who are Asian, um, none who um, are um, black or African American, 30 exams um, for students who are Hispanic, and 18 who are in the category of multiracial, and that's how they identified themselves. And the, so exams, not individual students. Exams, not individual students. So when you look at the number of exams, it was 504. Um, so it's a small number, but I will say that um, my gut, and so, let me know I mean, if you think I'm wrong on this one. I, th I think it's still a little bit early from the condensed classes for the AP level so early, mm -hmm. I, I think. But let me know what you think on that one. <laughs> Either one. Linda, thank you. Or Dr. Doxer, thank you for bringing that question up. I really think that that is um, the next phase of our equity work here at the high school, um, I think we are still seeing inequities. And in our leadership team, we had um, department chairs uh, share information about um, at uh, the courses and the levels, um, how many students were on IEPs or 504s in those particular classes, 9 through 12. Um, and still very underrepresented in upper level classes, um, students with disabilities, students on IEPs or 504s, and overly represented in our um, remaining college prep and the strong, some strong college prep. It's a little more balanced where we, where we see the um, detracking um, in, in some of the subjects, but where the tracks still do exist, there's still an imbalance and inequity. And so that is the work that we are, will be continuing um, to detract those levels. And then I think that there's some really uh, powerful work and support that we can provide to our teachers um, to increase sense of efficacy, um, to, inc to increase um, their expectations around um, the, the capabilities of, of students with disabilities, uh, and also around our students of, of color, um, kind of uh, taking a look at, um, at our own biases, for example, um, implicit biases, making sure that we're aware of those, making sure that we're, um, we're practicing culturally competent um, and sensitive um, instruction and pedagogy. So I think that is really, that's the rich work that, that we really need to continue. Thank you very much. Yeah. So exciting. What you're doing. Yeah, and we're embracing that work. Yeah. So just know that we are embracing that. And um, you know, philosophically, we're all on the same page. Um, this is the work that we want to do and engage in uh, for the betterment of all of our students. Mr. Wise. I'll add my thank you. Um, and I think by now I've got my reputation of being the data guy, so I'm going to ask data questions. Uh, as amongst other things. I was told to prepare myself for that. So. <laughs> OK, <laughs> good. Um, you know, if you were to scroll back and look at some of the graphs there, you have 244 students from last year. Um, so I'm, I'm interpreting that to mean unique students, not one kid takes five classes, so Correct. they count for five. Correct. Right? Yes. Um, 
I'm also interpreting that to mean it's across grades. So a sophomore taking an AP class, a junior taking an AP class, a senior taking an AP class. Correct. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so it would help me on a go forward basis if we were to look at this as like a stack bar chart. You have 30 sophomores, 60 juniors, however many seniors, okay. as the case may be. Because okay. um, that will also kind of start, start to show to a degree some of what Linda's talking about. And, and then if you think about other stack bar charts as you look at this would be demographical information, mm -hmm. right? That will demonstrate the equity, that will demonstrate other things that we see with this kind of information. Okay. Um, so thank you um, in advance to a degree, but uh, that's, there's that. Um, and if you go to the previous slide then, one more, another question on this one is, um, the percent accepted, I, whichever one it was that had the, the, the various different bar charts, uh, so. Five-year comparison application. Yeah, that one. Yep. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about that percent accepted number? It seems graphically, it seems to be very low, like in the 10 or 20 percent. Um, but maybe that's just the way it's presenting. And if, do you have any other detail behind that number? Um, okay. So if I was to click on that from the computer, I would have the exact numbers. <laughs> um, I will tell you, it looks like it's at that 20 percent. It's really not. It is significant. It's. I want to. I don't know the number off the top of my head with the percentage without clicking on the computer, um, but the number is much higher. Um, like previous years, like 67% of our students got into their first choice school. Like it is, it's definitely a much higher number. Um, it's not in that 20%, but I don't have the number off the top of my head. Right okay. Yep. Yeah. So that, that's another, you know, presentation type thing there. Looking at there's 2,000 plus applications. You know, maybe they applied to five schools, they got their first one, so they don't care about the other four, mm -hmm. and therefore it makes that number go down. Yeah. You know, something okay. else along those lines. So it's understanding that as well okay. will help in, yeah. in this on a go forward basis. And then my last question is a little bit more, a little bit different. Um, this is a lot about the college process and things along those lines. My understanding and interpretation is you have a much bigger role than just that. Um, and so I'm curious about how, how do you manage and this may be going a little bit towards what Mrs. Boynton is going to start asking about or talking about as, as well. So um, how do you manage the, percept, the concerns of students in crisis type situations? How do you have them? Is there like a, how do they come into the office? How do you receive, what's the reception process? What's the, okay, we're hearing you process. I mean, there's 1,200 kids here. There's six or eight of you. How do you possibly see them? You know, can you talk a little bit through that process for us? Sure. I, I'm glad that you bring that up because you're right. I am here. I've been asked to present on the college data, but there's so much more that guidance counselors do. And moving into next year, um, we're moving into changing our title um, to school counselors to match the American School Associ Counselors Association because what we do is so much more than just guidance. There is a lot of the personal counseling that we're doing and the crisis that work that we're doing. So um, I can kind of talk about it in a few different directions. So our goal um, as of a few years ago um, was to make sure that we know all students. So that's when we, on our caseload, so that's when we switched our model to doing developmental guidance seminars specifically with our students. Um, so those are during flex blocks. So we get to see them in a classroom setting, which is really nice. Um, we get to know them a little bit more through those sessions, but I'll admit those are only a few sessions. My goal is that we, in a few years, hopefully we can have a schedule change where guidance counselors can be teaching more classes so we get to know our students even more and talk about so many of these topics that are so important, whether it be um, the anxiety that they're facing, dating violence. There's so many different topics that we're talking to kids individually about, and it would be great to do the education with them in a group setting. But there is that personal counseling, and there are so many students who are struggling with a whole variety of different social, emotional, behavioral issues. And so that's the individual work that we're doing. And so um, 
to, to get appointments with us, students um, can remind text or they can email us um, or they can come into the guidance office. We have one secretary who's doing a lot of different things. Um, students can get passes from their teachers to come down or we can send for them. Um, so there's a whole variety of ways that kids come into the guidance office. I would say over the last um, two years, the most common way for students to make appointments is through the remind text because that comes right to us um, as opposed to them um, coming to the secretary. The secretary has to come back, find out if we're there. If not, she's telling them to come back. So um, all the counselors prefer either the remind text or the email just to make appointments. But there are plenty of students who are struggling during the day and they don't, it's not appropriate for them to remind text and um, make an appointment for say tomorrow or a few days from now. Our priority, even if we have meetings already set um, for working with say a, se a senior or in the spring when we're working with juniors and we have a meeting set for the college process, if somebody's coming in in crisis or um, in distress or just feeling like they need to talk to somebody, um, that's our priority. We are working with those kids and we might touch base with them immediately just to find out the different level and what's going on with them. Um, and, and we have just learned how to juggle our different responsibilities. Sometimes we have to reschedule meetings if there is a crisis or a kid needs us immediately. Um, other times we can talk to them um, quickly kind of help them, kind of gather themselves, figure out like what's going on, help them use the strategies that we've been working with them or maybe their outside therapist who's working with us to um, help them use those strategies, get them back to class and then we um, see them when they have their study or another time when we're open. But it's, it's, an, it's, it's balancing, it's part of why um, the counselors, we love our job. There's never a dull moment, there's always something going on. Um, but I think those are, I, I think that answers a little bit of like how they can make appointments and come see us. Yeah, it does. I mean, I, I can add a little bit. Yeah. If you, if you don't mind. Um, the guidance department partners very, very closely with administration in the main office and both assistant principals uh, are part of our uh, student support team process. Um, there are weekly meetings, I think every Thursday, um, between guidance counselors and assistant principals to information share. And um, in, in any crisis, it's always a partnership. We've got a strong um, school psychologist team as well as social worker team that are actively involved as well in any crisis situation with an an individual student or, or group and then we've sort of repurposed and rebranded um, uh, an additional information sharing and, and more sort of case management approach um, we're <coughs> calling it um, castle um, where administration and assistant principals spe specifically because they've got students on their caseload guidance counselors social workers will bring to the table uh, a really tricky student situation to bounce ideas and problem solve. Um, so that's yet another structure as well. Uh, and guidance meets regularly on Mondays, yes, Mondays. Um, Mondays as a team. And then the social workers also will push in to that and the social workers have their own meeting um, facilitated by the team chairs. Um, so there's really, it's very a complex um, system of supports and always looking to make it better, um, which is why we brought back uh, Castle. Can I ask a follow-up? Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you. You somewhat circumvented one of my follow-ups with it was the special education integration to that. So um, thank you with that. Um, you didn't actually say anything, though, about teacher referrals. So if a teacher is seeing a problem in a classroom with a student that yeah. maybe is maybe hidden from you, you're not going to see it because you're in the office or anything else like that, and yes. maybe the student's not one that's going to just walk into your office and say, I need to talk to somebody, is there a process for teacher referrals? There is. So that is um, part of our SST process. So we have, um, and this was developed last year, just a, a process for everyone to follow. So if there is a, stu a teacher who is concerned about a student, it could be academic, it could be about them just personally, social, emotional, like they, they just feel like something um, seems off, whatever it be, they'll contact the guidance counselor. 
um, we'll get, get the information. Um, and then we also reach out to all the teachers to see how they're doing in all the classes because just the grades that are in the portal or on their report card, it, that's just one piece of information. We want to know what's really going on in the classroom. If it's something that is an individual classroom situation, then we're going to work with the student, the parent, the teacher in that particular class. If it's something that is more global and happening um, that they're seeing patterns in different classes, or maybe it's something that's going on outside of school, that's when we have our SST process, where we gather all the teachers together, um, and we talk about um, what are the strengths of the students, what are the areas that we are concerned. We come up with um, a goal of how we want to work together as a team to help the student be more successful in school. So that's kind of a short term, four to six weeks. Um, we're um, implementing a different um, um, interventions, thank you, <laughs> um, and then we revisit it after a few weeks to see how it's going. If it's going really well, then we're like, let's continue with this. If it's not going so well, then we're bringing the team back together to figure out, okay, what's the next step? What do we need to do? So it's kind of like the pre-referral um, and trying to provide a, a variety of different um, in interventions for them. Great. Um one more thing, not a question, just a, I guess, a statement or idea. Um, I know that there have been historically schools, and I believe there still are, that have the idea of a student counselor, that maybe a, a, a senior that's somebody who's well respected or that is well understood or known around the school, and it, and maybe even has time in their schedule because they've finished a lot of their credits or things like that, um, would be available to potentially be trained to help with freshmen with little questions or sophomores that have little questions that might divert some related challenges. Um, I see more going yes, so I'm, I'm happy that it's actually resonating quickly with one of our students in the room. Um, maybe an extension of the ambassador program that you, you do in, in August or something else along those lines that those kind of students that are your leaders might help divert some of the other yeah, low hanging fruit for lack of a better way to say. talked and have not yet fully implemented. We've, uh, we've made the ambassadors uh, a little bit more robust, but I really, um, I am very keen on um, peer mentor, uh, you know, a peer mentor type of arrangement, which is um, precisely what you're talking about, where um, it's not the heavy stuff, it's the light stuff, and it's connecting peer to peer. Um, and so that's something that we're definitely exploring um, to um, either pilot or to um, take additional steps for next year um, to kind of bring that into the fold. Yes. Else? What's the average caseload for a guidance counselor? Um, so <coughs> the average for the full-time counselors um, is 240. I have a smaller caseload because I'm the director, um, but the rest of um, the counselors have roughly about 240. Thank you. If you ever miraculously find more money and you want to give us more <laughs> counselors, I would love that number to go below 200. Yeah, Second lot. secretary, Two, we could have now. the ideal guidance department. If you don't ask, you don't get it, so you might as well ask, right? <laughs> thank Anything you. else? That's good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. That's a lot of students. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to share a little information today, just high school updates about Late Start, the handbook, portrait of the graduate, and this is in order, and uh, just an update on the emergency situation from Friday. In terms of Late Start, uh, we, as you know, we implemented Late Start uh, in September uh, of this year, really August, the first days of school. Um, we had a... Um, a plan for uh, drop-off that we needed to revise. We revised that drop-off plan, and by all accounts, and I've popped out there periodically, we, I was out there for the basically the first three full weeks, almost a month at the beginning, and um, drop-off with just a few hiccups based on weather has, has actually gone very, very smoothly and have heard um, many positive comments. I think a few people have had some negative experiences. Those are um, seem to be rare on bad weather days uh, or when someone was running late, but by all accounts, the drop-off has been fairly smooth, um, and we've gotten good reports on that. We met, we met as a group on 
uh, November 21st, and there were administrators and teachers there, about equal numbers of each. Um, we talked sort of anecdotally about how things were going, and um, we shared a little bit of uh, data, and some of that was that the overall tardies are, are down uh, for first quarter, and overall attendance is up. We came up with a plan to uh, conduct three separate surveys for parents, students, and staff after December break, really halfway through the year, um, to get uh, a pulse on how things are going. Uh, and short survey, maybe five questions. We'll be developing that um, before, uh, before the first of the year, sharing it with members of the committee to get feedback and then disseminating that survey uh, after December break, sometime mid-January, um, to parents, students, and staff to get um, to get feedback. Students are using the field house and fitness center before school. Those are uh, staffed uh, by uh, uh, PE teachers, and, um, and so it's those those spaces are in, in active use um, and very popular. The library as well is buzzing in the morning uh, and after school, and that's also supervised. Library is available from 7:45 until 8:30, and then after school, it's available until 3:45 uh, as well. We are looking uh, to get a little more data about um, breakfast. Anecdotally, um, Edra Santos reports that business in the morning is robust uh, for breakfast, um, but we'll look to get a little bit of data, uh, a little bit more specific data on that. The athletic schedule, uh, similar to last year, I'm going to have Tom come up and, and answer any questions you may have. Um, the scheduling of the field house as well as the ice and pool time most definitely has been a challenge. Um, so that 100% that, that um, has been a challenge. Um, and our next meeting is January 9th, uh, where we will um, basically approve the, the survey and um, plan for dissemination of the survey. Um, Overall, I think folks are fairly positive about the late start, but we want to definitely get the data from the survey um, to find out a little bit more specifically about each of the three populations um, that are impacted. So I'm going to stop here, and if you have questions about late start or athletics related to late start. Can I add a couple of things yep. to piggyback yes. with this? So a couple of other observations uh, that were a little bit more outside the scope of the, the high school piece. Um, as you know, RISE at the high school was involved with this as well, and we moved RISE specifically to an earlier start prior to the high school start so that um, that traffic could be out prior to the, um, the high school mm -hmm. traffic coming in. And we did a rolling um, drop-off in the morning, which has worked out very well. Yeah. Um, also, in the conversations I've had with Reading Police Department and uh, through just anecdotal observations, the traffic on Birch Meadow Drive um, has not been the issue that it could have been. Um, part of the reason is that Coolidge now is uh, the earliest drop-off, um, so that traffic is gone by the time Birch Meadow and High School are doing their drop-offs. So that, that also seems to have worked. And then something we discovered uh, with the, the snow recently is that by having the high school start later, it gives the high school and the facilities department, DPW, an extra hour of uh, plowing, cleaning um, of sidewalks and things like that, which is huge. So now our earliest uh, school that's opening are the two middle schools. So it, that is actually an added benefit that has helped. Thank you. That makes total sense, actually, with our student drivers as well, and more cars in the parking lot, more time to plow. Um, thank you. Are there any questions about late start? What Dr. Doxer. Oh, sorry. That's all right. <laughs> um, how have you found the adherence to um, respecting the hours of students? Like, evening meetings not going later, morning meetings not going earlier. Has that been a challenge? As far as the information that has come my way, people are being respectful. Now, if 
there's different information, I most definitely want to hear it. Um, morning meetings may uh, are voluntary, and they may not start earlier than 8 o'clock um, for any students. And, and many, I would say um, the advertisements for clubs um, meeting in the morning, that is an, that's been a, 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 they've been following that with fidelity. Um, Absolutely. Um, rehearsals for plays, those are, are um, a little bit different um, as you get closer to playtime. Um, but I do know that um, the drama department um, is absolutely committed to supporting this work 100%. Um, and I would say that our athletics teams, with a few, um, a few scheduling exceptions that, that were fairly rare, they've also made modifications to their practice times to, to honor the spirit and the, the goal of, of this uh, initiative. That's the information that I, that, that I have. If, if there is different information, I, that's, that's partly the, the purpose of the survey as well, is that people may feel more comfortable f filling a survey out versus coming in person, so that, that's one of the reasons that we want to do the survey. I, I really appreciate, again, you're putting, st stretching your necks out there to really find out the mm -hmm. true information. We've I seen, um, I mean, just in terms of, and, and this is not, um, it's anecdotal, but just the, the, the vibe in the mornings yeah. is l less crazy. It, it is just a smooth kind of, you kind of relaxed feel to the beginning of the day and Maura I don't know if you're kind of nodding your head do you feel that yeah it's I definitely just a little feel more that. even just like getting ready for school mm -hmm. the routine is way less hectic and you definitely feel better rested and prepared for your first period class whereas before last year you definitely were more groggy and in the morning it was more of a fight to get everyone to school yeah. Yeah, and with our tardy numbers down, um, we definitely want to find out if students are getting more sleep. Uh, so that's a question that will be asked, uh, because that's certainly a goal of, of Late Start, is that students are getting um, more sleep. So we want to make sure that that, that in fact, is happening. And, and it'll be interesting to see, hopefully, it's, you know, find a way to link families. But um, students, we hope, will self-report, but then also families. And we'll see the difference between what the kids are saying and what the, what the parents are saying um, in terms of more or less or the same amount of sleep. As well as stress levels. We'll see if, that, if there's been an impact on stress levels um, due to late start, which was also another goal. I'd, I'd also be interested, and I don't know, I, I know you want to keep the survey short, and so I'm not saying this should be on the survey, but I'm interested in kids' use of stimulants to stay awake. And the, the challenges that we have with vaping now, and the nicotine gives the boost. I know that's an addiction issue, but you know, the, the five hour energy drinks and the, and the coffee, <laughs> is there a change with people coming in with their coffees? But I don't know that you can, no, that might just be from observation yeah, or, that's, that's, or whatever, but I'm, There could I, be a question designed out of, out of that. Are you, I, are you, is there, are you using a, an art, like an artificial stimulant, you right. know, in any way? Has um, that changed? Has that changed? Now that they're able to right. get more natural sleep, are they finding they don't need it? as much. I, I just, it all ties together in the health of our kids. And when they're exhausted, I know I go for chocolate. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Did you have a question, John? I thought you said. Thank you. I'll ask one. I'll okay, go ahead. Two, actually. Um, one of the other things that was a precursor for this was the homework committee. Um, have we seen maybe this was talked about November 21st or anything else like that have we seen a reduction I I know I'm not seeing it but I wasn't my child wasn't here last year either but um, have, have we what are you hearing from the teachers what are you hearing from the students with regards to homework and the and the load and whether or not that that part is pushing back just because their school's ending you know an hour later and whatnot honestly I think that is work that we still have to do it's sort of shifting mm -hmm. the culture in the building about expectations uh, I think that and that dovetails with the um, the, uh, um, the equity work that uh, from a prior question that Dr. Doxer brought up that is shifting culture and shifting mindsets which does take time so I don't think that we've seen the needle move where we need to or where we want to on the homework front Maura would you yeah, I'm going to be honest. I think my homework is just as much as I've had in the past, if not more. So, and I'm hoping students will be honest in the survey um, about that, because that there is shifting the needle again, changing culture, changing practice, um, 
and shifting expectations to, to be more reasonable, definitely work that we need to do. Okay. Go ahead, Mel. I mean, the other one was, I mean, the, the athletic schedule in the fall, you know, you mentioned pool time, you mentioned ice time, which are winter, well, pool time was a fall related thing for the young ladies. Um, but the athletic schedule in terms of the turf, obviously we had the challenge with turf two being down, which probably exacerbated it. Um, would you expect that once we get turf two back, which hopefully we'll hear about later today, um, we will be able to go and stop at six o'clock like was promised, or are we still going to be going till seven, seven thirty, um, in with the athletic practice I'm next this fall? Over to, to Tom Zaya, our athletic director. I think what we did this year with the turf is um, we did a lot more of our practices on grass. So I think we were fairly lucky with the weather. We um, our football team almost exclusively practiced on grass. I think the other thing is it depends on our game schedules. There are some days that we the way our schedule falls, we have to get two or three games in on our turf fields. So I still think it's going to be a challenge. I think it's going to be obviously a help having uh, turf two open. Um, and it's, it's, it came out really nice as well. Dr. Dox. I, I promise it, it's quick. I just wanted to find out how you're going to push out these surveys to try to get the maximum reply rate. I'll likely create a Google surveys uh, with the, the help of the committee um, or the, the team. It's not really a full committee. It's the like a working group, um, but likely create three separate ones and send them out um, multiple times. Um, I make announcements over um, through my newsletter, um, send it out um, through all the all staff news, um, and then students through um, through the Plus Portal. Students and parents can receive. Um, you know, I can send to the whole student body, um, and where there's two separate surveys, I would send the, the one survey to, to the student-specific survey to students, and then the parent-specific survey to parents. Um, and then, you know, for for students, I would um, encourage teachers to make that announcement. Um, if we could turn over part of a flex block, that students could, um, you know, their flex block teacher, they could announce that hey, survey's available. Why don't you take the, and we're really thinking like a five minute survey tops, right? So everybody, you know, take out your phones if you got it or whatever device you're using and, um, and fill out the surveys Will during the a flex block. Will the teachers get an opportunity as well? Uh, yes, absolutely. So I would, I would probably turn over uh, a couple minutes of a faculty meeting for staff to fill out the survey. Probably about five to 10. Will it be a, um, a format that limits multiple replies by the same person, or is it? Yes. Uh, one thing I want to mention, I just forwarded Kate a recent study on Late Start. Um, and in this study, they uh, said that it took about three years to see the full effect of Late Start. So I just want to uh, make that a mention, that we want to get the information, you know, we want this to be as friendly and as seamless as possible and whatever we can do to work with students and families and staff to make this work to its optimal um, reason for doing it we're, we're going to look at that but i also want to just publicly state that we might not see the full benefits it takes a while to see that um, in this particular study that was done i think it was outside of chicago uh, they, after three to five years, they, they had students report that they were on average getting 45 more minutes of sleep a day out of that hour. So, you know, are we seeing that now? No. I can tell you we're not. We have a lot of kids here at eight, but as Mara mentioned and, and um, Mrs. Boyton mentioned, it's, it's a much softer start. Kids are friendlier in the morning. There's time to chit chat in the morning. Um, and I think it's all about that relationship building that we want to do too. Um, so I'll be excited to see what the what the survey say, but I just want to put that out that you know a few months. I mean, we've only been doing it for a couple of months, so right, right. And and this, quite frankly, it, it is a shift in culture, yep. and culture change in an organization is three to five years. Do, do we have that protection? Like when we embarked on that this this pilot. I can't remember, did we build in that we're going to do this for X amount of time so that people aren't expecting, like, not a the not answer a now? Not a pilot. This, this, this is, is not, not a, pilot. a pilot. Okay, so, all right. 
so there won't be pressure to prematurely judge. No, this is this is not a pilot. No. Can't guarantee there won't be pressure. <laughs> I don't think we can guarantee there won't be pressure, right? right. I mean, we can no. hope there won't be, but we can't guarantee no. it. And that's what no. the survey's for, though, to help us and then address those issues, right? Mm -hmm. Try to minimize the impact as much as we can, yeah. the negative impact. Right, but if we see a common theme yeah. that appears through all three groups, clearly there be there would be work and, and steps for us to take to mitigate whatever that impact would be. And so that's, you know, I, I really want to dig into that um, and find out um, kind of how people are feeling, what is the, the impact, um, and then figure out solutions from there. Um, maintaining, maintaining late start because it's best for kids. Thank you. Am I all set to move on to yes. handbook? Okay, Thank cool. Um, so RMHS School Council, uh, we have a, a, got a great robust group um, that finally kind of um, congealed in October um, and met. Um, we approved setting the goal um, as one of our major goals to begin to revise the RMHS handbook uh, for this year. At that meeting, I gave kind of a visual overview, which <laughs> by all accounts was fairly overwhelming because it, it's a very large document. Um, but I had it projected on the screen and we kind of scrolled through. Um, and um, began to sort of get a, a just a visual sense of um, what this document appears to uh, for for students, uh, and it's overwhelming, and for parents as well, it is overwhelming. Um, and so the you know the need definitely is there to um, to make some revisions. We set a goal to do um, a dive into the handbook individually between October and December. We reserved November for a talk about the school improvement plan. Um, so but between October and December, um, members were going to read, sort of make some um, kind of more global observations about the handbook. We met on 12-11. We were originally scheduled to meet uh, on the day of the, the snow day. So we, um, we had to reschedule and then based on availability, and I think it was the Parker concert because we would have pushed it to the 10th, but um, Parker concert, um, we would not have had a quorum. So we met on the 11th. Um, and honestly, based on the events of um, from Friday, school council really asked for me to do an update. Um, and so we did table a full on discussion of the handbook um, at that time. So on Wednesday, they really felt that um, we couldn't really go there. Um, what we were able to do was to, um, we made a decision to provide, and each member, um, we decided against going into subcommittees um, to provide comments and edits, um, or edit suggestions, language edit suggestions for the first three sections of the handbook. Um, and so we'll be doing that in a Google Doc um, with editing, uh, with um, commenting permissions and taking a look at the first three sections of the handbook making comments and then coming back together at our January meeting um, to come to agreement about the rewording or, or any edits um, that we wanted to make for those sections. Um, and we made, and we took a vote on this as well, that to tackle section by section for each, um, for each monthly meeting. Um, I don't believe that that gives us enough time for the year to do the whole handbook. So this may be a year and a half process. And I, I would say to do due diligence to a handbook change, um, I would prefer slow and methodical um, and thorough to rushing through because you make mistakes there. Um, we also need to run this by legal counsel as well, which can take some time. Um, and so we will, um, and, and uh, getting feedback from the group, we decided to, together that the first two sections are really short. The third section is a little more meaty, and we figured that was probably as much as we could bite off between now and our January meeting. Um, at that January meeting, we're going to then decide as a group um, to uh, which sec which are the next sections that we will dive into. And, and as you go into the handbook, the sections become sort of meatier and meatier, if you will. So it may be a single section that we will will take on. Um, we do have an obligation, naturally, to share with the faculty um, at a meeting um, to be scheduled sometime in the spring. I'd like to make some progress on any language um, to share with the faculty any, um, any of the changes. I would like 
at least you know, what we have made suggestions on and have vetted by our legal counsel. Um, obviously, the school committee has to approve whatever changes have been made um, in July. Um, so that is our goal, is to have as much as we can done, edited, approved, vetted by faculty and our legal counsel by whatever July meeting date school committee decides. And so if you know that, I would love that because I'm a backwards planner. Um, so again, we may need two, two years to fully do this um, based on how meaty the document is and that we only meet once a month for about an hour to an hour and a half. And I know um, that may not be an ideal timeline for some, but I, again, I would rather be slow and methodical and purposeful and do it right than have to go back and do it again. Um, and so that's, that's our handbook update. And I don't know if you have any questions at all about that. Oh, one, one thing I forgot, um, that we are uh, taking a look just at other schools' handbooks just to see, kind of get a sense out there, is what, what do they look like? What kind of language do they have? Um, you know, not necessarily throwing everything out, but are there, is, are there things that we would want to incorporate? Is there, uh, I don't know, an executive sort of summary or sort of snapshots that are really user-friendly for kids um, that include handbook language, but it's not the whole handbook, you know? So we're looking um, at, at samples and things like that that other schools have. They're all public documents, so we're able to very easily access those um, and then, you know, get <coughs> ideas. Mr. White. First of all, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, um, three times. Um, I'll be running out the and door two minutes to go downstairs <laughs> myself to go listen to the course, so I apologize for that in advance. Um, have I think one of the big questions coming out of our July conversation was whether or not to include policies verbatim in the handbook or refer to them. Have you had a chance to have that conversation with the school council? Not yet with school council, but I can tell you from my own experience um, in, this is my fourth district over 25 years in education. Um, many districts now are linking to school Absolutely. committee policies and not including them verbatim in, in, the, um, in the handbook itself. It makes handbooks sometimes 200 pages, mm -hmm. which is not reader friendly at all. Um, and so my prior district went to linking most. Um, there, was, there were some relevant policies around discipline um, that were, the text was in there, but some of the other um, policies were just, were hyperlinked in the document itself. Um, if I had to guess, I think that the, my current school council would be in favor of that, but I haven't asked them yet. Okay, thank you. Have you I'm going to run um, Yeah, thanks. Have you, and I don't know, John, you can in, in, <clears throat> tell me it's not necessary, but is, has any, from, anyone from RTA involved in those discussions? Because I'm sensing that there's got to be elements of the handbook that could. There's no contractual you know, language. No, there's no contractual. Not students. contractual, but if there's any uh, components of it that, uh, that, pertains to a work day of a teacher or okay no none of that this is all sure. all for students, all students. Uh, student expectations so it, yeah handbook for students and I have teachers I you know it's so I have teachers on the on the school council uh, okay. group as well just wanted to make sure of that yeah. just yes. two quick things um, I really appreciate your your thoughtful approach of being slow and methodical and maybe not getting it done as quickly as we'd all like. I think that's the exact right approach for a project this big and important. Um, and I also wanted to um, sort of validate your instinct about the policy question. I'll be interested to hear how the school council lands on it. But in addition to the point you made, which I think readability and length is really important, there's also whenever policies are in other places, every time the school committee changes a policy, you need to think through all the places that policy, because then you get an alignment issue where we've changed a policy, it's updated in our manual on the website, but maybe right. we didn't think to update the handbook, and now you've got two different policies. If you link to the policy, it's automatically linking to the most updated policy. So that right, would just Right, and if be you just more, refer to it. Right, then, right. it's yeah. just one more reason okay. that I think that's, um, it strikes me as a better approach as well. Thank you. Dr. Dr. I also was um, happy to hear you say that not all policies 
would necessarily be linked. As a paper person, thank you, Linda Engelson, so much for providing me with my packet so I can go through and on paper. Um, things like discipline policies or repercussions, consequences, those kinds of things, I think are very helpful for parents and kids to have at their fingertips. And for, I know last night it was, um, Ms. Theriot said that she goes through the handbook with the students before the year gets underway. And so I think that's really important to have that and in a document. So I understand the readability, and um, but there are some things that are really also very handy to have in print. Uh, absolutely, uh, and both assistant uh, both assistant principals did that with with all of their their classes. Um, so that that's something. But I would say, you know, it's a it's a, a hundred page document, and that was back in August uh, twenty something. And kids forget if you're not sort of constantly referring back to it, which is part of my thinking around um, a, like a reference. Yeah guide or some, some sort of key points that is more easily accessible um, that is perhaps, I don't know if it's an appendix to the handbook or you know an addendum, something like that. That's not the handbook itself, but it is handbook light, if you will. Um, am I ready to move on to the portrait of the graduate? I'm very excited about this. Um, so <clears throat> recently, uh, Dr. Doherty and I um, sent out an invitation to the community uh, to join the Portrait of the Graduate Design Team. And um, we got some pretty great uh, response back. Um, Dr. Doherty and I met this morning, and we have the makings of a, a really robust team. Um, there's a few, um, a few stakeholder roles that we're, we're trying to shore up a little bit more. We, I think we need a few more students uh, to get involved. Um, among uh, some other, I think that was one of the, the bigger pieces um, to have a couple um, couple more students involved. We hope to have uh, the design team set uh, and sort of determined before December break. That's, I think, an ambitious goal, but I think we would like to do that based on the timing of the rollout. Um, communicate with the design team, introduce them virtually to one another, and then set a meeting date, which would be sometime right after the um, the new year, um, and the design team would be would meet prior to the rollout um, to talk to each other, set uh, you know inter introduce one another um, uh, as a team, kind of set our purpose, set our goal, and um, set meeting you know meeting norms and all of that, uh, and pr probably provide some reading material um, to kind of set the foundation for our work preview the steps ahead, and then ultimately the goal and the timeline we would be communicating. The kickoff event um, is an evening community viewing of the film Most Likely to Succeed based on a Ted Dintersmith book. Um, that we hope will be January 15th in the evening. Uh, we'll invite the full community. It's a really compelling film um, about how we are preparing our students for this global 21st century. It's a really powerful film. And um, I'm hoping that it, that it sparks some energy. I, sh I showed it to my, uh, my leadership team at, at the high school, and they were kind of blown away by the ideas from the film. We hope to uh, and plan to follow up with a half PD day. I think this was district wide. Yes, um, yeah. it district is. wide mm -hmm. on January 17th, also with the viewing of the same film, and then go through uh, at least at the high school level. Um, I'll be um, co-leading um, a, a vision of the graduate protocol, and it's a protocol that Chris Kelly and I and Danielle Tyson went uh, through. We engaged in really over two days, but there's a more condensed version. We'll be going through this protocol. Um, um, design process with the staff, my staff, on that um, on that Friday following the, the film <coughs> viewing. The design team will continue to work getting input and feedback from the various uh, schools um, and others around the district in the spring, uh, probably a few times over the summer, and then into the early fall. And we hope to have school committee approval. Um, John, am I is my timeline correct in October? October, October yes. of 2020. 
and um, in time, um, it, well in time for our NIASC decennial visit, which will be in December of 2020. It's actually, it was, it'll be, it's a year last, uh, a year from now last week, over three days in December. Uh, and again, remember that, um, that NIASC is really the impetus, the original impetus for what they call the vision of the graduate, we're calling a portrait of the graduate, um, but we hope ultimately that what comes out of this is this beautiful vision for who we want our children to become and to be when, when they, you know, at, at various um, benchmark points of their, in their lives uh, as students here at Reading Memorial High School, or at, in the Reading Public Schools, and then when they, when they leave our doors um, upon graduation from Reading Memorial High School, and how are we preparing them? What are the, the mindsets, the skills, the dispositions um, that we want them to embody, embrace, and, and practice um, once they leave our doors? Uh, so I'm really excited about this. And they, once this is created, it will naturally kind of dovetail with the creation of uh, district and, and school improvement plans, because this is a pre-K-12 process. And we're really committed to that. Some schools have gone solely just nine through twelve. Um, other you know, other districts have taken a more holistic approach, <clears throat> and we've gotten feedback from those districts that it's been a really rich process and really rewarding pre-K through twelve. Um, so that's where we are. Great. So I know we have to. Uh, the school committee has to uh, recommend a member. So if we don't have to. Do it right this sec, but if you want to let me know, uh, we can get the uh, person. Yeah, we'll need to know that uh, early that, next week. Before your meeting, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. So my last item, in the, if there are no questions on, on vision, uh, is just an update on the, the fire, the emergency situation from last Friday. As you know, a fire was set in the boys' bathroom on the third floor, English Social Studies wing. Uh, last Friday uh, morning. Uh, it is currently an active school police and fire investigation, um, so ongoing. Communication was sent to families first by Dr. Doherty uh, about 70 minutes after the initial alarm. I followed up with communication that Friday evening. Um, the Friday uh, after school, uh, we had an emergency faculty meeting that lasted for about uh, an hour and a half uh, where we talked about the situation with the faculty, heard feedback, took questions. Prior to that, um, met with um, the beginnings of a building crisis team to debrief the emergency response, what went well and what could be improved upon. Um, that team, um, it, it is a, a professional goal of Lynna Williams, who was just here, Director of Guidance, and Craig Murray. They are co-leading the Oh, Linda, you're still here. Um, so, uh, yay, thanks for saying. Um, so, Linda and Craig, they, they're working and have been working on the launching a crisis team. So, we had already sort of talked about who might be on it, and people really did step up in the moment. They'll be continuing that work um, to make sure that we do have um, a fully fleshed out and really tiered crisis response team. Um, but we, we talked about what went well and what areas could be improved and got faculty feedback about that as well. Um, uh, communication, further communication was sent to families on Sunday uh, early afternoon. We had a full school meeting on Monday with students where uh, really I communicated a message that their fundamental, our fundamental hu human right of safety, safety is a fundamental human right, was violated, was taken away um, from them by an act of someone in their very own community. Uh, and I expressed my outrage that this, this human right and this basic human need was in fact violated. And, um, and, you know, schools are places of learning, and you can't learn. Learning cannot take place when one does not feel safe. Um, you go into that fight or flight mode, and you're not you're not able to think and process and learn. Um, I also um, sort of a rally and cry for who are we as a school? We're at a turning point, and uh, do we want to be known for good and for kindness and for empathy, or for this other path? Um, and I, I urged folks to join me with, um, you know, the path to good. 
We had a community-wide town hall meeting um, that was held last night. There were, Chris, 65 65 people? in the audience and then the administrators up yep, front. Yep, administrators and, and staff were, were present. So 65 members of uh, the audience. Uh, I shared basically what I just shared with all of you, and, and we took questions and had a, had a dialogue. Um, we're not done. There was definitely a, a sense that we want to continue this conversation. Um, there was feedback emails that I've received from folks who could not attend but who wanted to because there were a number of activities that took place last night. Um, and one activity that I missed was the, the football banquet. And um, I, so I had several parents who were at that who could not, could, right. could not attend. So what I'll be doing is uh, Chris took notes. Uh, and I will be sending out uh, really a, a summary of the meeting um, based on the notes that Chris took, and I thank you for that very much, because folks who could not make it, at least they get, they'll get they get a sense of what was talked about um, at the meeting. Next steps that we're taking um, would be, uh, I'm hoping to have another community-wide event uh, about school climate and culture. I would much prefer it to be a World Cafe style conversation so that we come out with some action steps. This definitely, we needed to hear people's questions, um, there's a heightened sense of, um, of anxiety around this event, understandably so, and so people needed to be able to express that. But moving forward, how do we work together to improve our school culture and climate um, so that this very, very small, small um, number of students um, who are engaging in, in this behavior um, that we're able to find a way to support them and that the, you know that we over you know we, we support them in order to help them make good decisions um, and I want to just acknowledge that all the good I mean Maura shared some really wonderful things that's 99% of our kids um, are just amazing um, we have taken some physical steps if you will some concrete steps in terms of procedures in order to bring a little bit more accountability um, and, and I would say safety really in the building to be honest with you um, consistent uh, taking of attendance every period um, that's 100% being um, enforced it was always an expectation but follow through um, has not always been with fidelity and so we're um, requiring teachers to take attendance and sending reminders again this is a change in, in a habit and in behavior which is hard to you know hard to do so those reminders are there uh, to take attendance every period students have to have passes just for accountability and they have to sign in and sign out of classes um, and I you know I put myself out there and imagine that um, God forbid there was another emergency and we didn't have a handle on who was in a class who wasn't in a class and then it becomes a safety and I have to say to a parent I'm sorry I, I, I don't know where your child was I can't live with that and so those procedures which used to be in place at RMHS and kind of slowly whittled away are now being re-implemented and um, the expectation is they are carried out with fidelity. Um, also with empathy and with kindness. We have to be, make sure that we do that as well um, and we're making human connections. So um, the hallway monitoring, um, we're talking with teachers and I'm, I'm modeling just how to, how to do that and check for passes where it's a conversation with a kid and you have a, a positive interaction. Hey, how's your day? How are you doing? Do you mind if I take a look at your pass? Um, and we do that. And, and I have to say, staff has really stepped up. They are taking time out of their very busy days in order to monitor the hallways. And it's just, it's been, it's been really nice to see. Um, and then you're, you're visible, you're out there, you can um, make connections with students and provide that just extra element of, of safety. Um, let's see. I think that's it in terms of the, the update uh, on, the, on the emergency. Um, Anybody have questions about that? Can I just add one piece? Um, so I, I, I want to thank, uh, first of all, I want to thank the work of the staff on the day of the fire. Absolutely. Um, we, it, it was really a team, a team response. Uh, you know, it's Kate has mentioned last night, uh, Kate and one of the assistant principals was at a workshop. Um, so there was, a, there was a lot of teacher leadership going on. The students did a great job working together to, to you know, uh, quietly exit out of the building. Um, there was no panic involved during, during the process. We had Rise Preschool, the same thing. Um, Central Office participated um, in it as well. Uh, Chris was at a workshop. 
out, out of district. So Gail and I were, were helping out during the process as well. We had facilities working, our SROs, police and fire. So it truly was a team effort to make sure that everything worked out smoothly. We also had three teachers um, who risked their own, you know, safety and uh, well-being by uh, turning the barrel over. Uh, probably saved hundreds of thousands of dollars in damage because the, be, as a result, the sprinklers did not activate, which would have had a lot of water damage on the third floor. Um, so, you know, the, it really truly was a team effort. And um, as we had mentioned to the committee in an email, uh, the facilities department worked with Service Master uh, to make sure that everything was clean and ready and sanitized for. Uh, for Monday um, so and that that cleaning will be continuing because it's with smoke damage it takes a while to to truly make sure it's fully sanitized so I just want to you know thank you for bringing commend up, and actually. recognize all of the efforts yeah absolutely I mean I, I arrived back on scene after and um, and things had that if there was a things were back to not normal but but more calm and my understanding is that people really absolutely stepped up and uh, and stepped in and you know proceeded with calm urgency if you will um, in in this emergency situation to remove people to safely uh, to safety um, calmly and and the students were fantastic and staff thank you thank you very much School improvements, I think, next week. Oh, social media. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Is there a motion? Um, no, there's no, there's no motion. There's no motion. No. Oh, I'm sorry. Did someone vote on this? I think there is not. No. It's just in the packet. Um, yeah, let me get my bearings. Yeah. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. All right. Yeah, um, so, so my understanding is that the school committee can provide feedback. Correct. On these school improvement plans. So I just wanted to um, to thank Dr. Doherty for putting them in the packet because I think it's nice to see it and it's great for the community to have access and realize that every school has its own individualized plan for how to improve student outcomes. Um, something we talked about over the last couple months in the committee has been how these are aligned to the district improvement plan, and I found um, in reviewing them a high level of cohesion, which I think is really important. You want everyone rowing in the same direction, and yet they're individual to the schools and what the individual parents and teachers and principal think needs to be focused on at that school. So I, I don't really have any feedback other than that, um, but I do appreciate seeing them in the packet. Yeah, I would agree. Anyone else? Just I know that the um, the student the uh, school councils are all volunteers as well, and it takes a lot of work to go through these. Having been on the school councils for years, um, I'm just very grateful for the work that they do with their principals. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Uh, the calendar. Mm -hmm. Do you want me? Okay. That we need a motion. Yes, you do. Do you want oh, to do the Yes. Motion? Move to approve the 2020 2021 school calendar. Second. Second. Did you have anything? Uh, just a couple, uh, as stated in the memo, uh, the, the calendar in essence has remained unchanged in terms of, uh, you know, previous calendars. I mean, the dates obviously have shifted. The one thing, Labor Day is later this year. Uh, next year so that is going to have an impact at the end of the school year um, but the professional development days are around the same time frame that they've been in the past uh, as, as mentioned um, and if all five snow days are used uh, last day of school will be on June 25th and if no snow days are used the last day of school will be on June 18th and then we have varying degrees uh, in between or past June 25th, depending on 
the weather. Um, last year we were fortunate we only had one snow day. So we'll see what happens. So I noticed we have uh, like some town meetings but not others like finance committee. Should we have town, town meeting dates on here as well? Or are those just finance committee? On the school calendar? You have them on the thing I'm looking at. Oh, I think that's the school committee. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong. I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I was looking at the school, say, school Linda, you're committee good. calendar. <laughs> sorry. Never mind. Yes. Um, I love that we have many different holidays from that are population could be celebrating. Um, I want to remind families um, that they can give their teachers a head up, heads up if their kids are not going to be in school. This is an excused absence. Um, and I also um, wanted to make sure that people realize that um, the Jewish holidays are on the weekends this time, which is handy, um, but it also means that Mondays it will be just as important not to have homework or tests due because um, families will be very preoccupied with the holidays and I just did not want that to get lost in this mix because there's a sigh of relief that it's not during the week, it still has implications for Monday for the kids, the families. We do have policies for that, so. Yes. Yes. And it's yeah, in don't. the policy, I just. Yes. Know. And the staff gets a very detailed memo with the exact dates. Yeah, we're into the third or, what, fourth year now with this? Or yeah, third? at least the fourth year. So, yeah. I mean. At least before. Yeah, we should hear feedback. Yeah. Okay. Is there already a fair vote? All those in favor? Five zero. Thank you. What else we got? Social media. Yep, social media. Policy. Yep. <laughs> so, shall we read the uh, motion? Oh, first? yes. I'll move to accept the first reading of policy BHE SM social media. Is there a second? A second. You want to start? Yeah. So I'll share with the committee. I actually have several proposed changes to this. So I don't know if you want to go section by section or if you want me to kick things off and just kind of go through and say everything. I don't know which is most efficient. Just jump through. I think that's okay. more efficient. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. So starting at the top of the policy, BHE SM, in the very first paragraph. Um, oh, first of all, uh, globally, there are elements of this I really, really like and I think are good to have. So I do want to say that, but there are some elements that I do have concerns with. So you're going to hear a little bit of them. Um, that first paragraph, I would like to propose that we cut the sentence at the end that begins as such to align with the goals outlined in policy KA, the school committee endeavors, and continues on. That entire sentence I would propose we cut. And my reason for that is if you actually look at policy KA, it does not talk about what the school committee will do. Um, policy KA says the school committee has these beliefs about the importance of school district community engagement and then outlines what the district will do. And so this actually, to me, represents not really the spirit of policy KA, and I don't think it's really meaningful to this policy. So I, I just would prefer to cut it. That's my first edit. Can, can I? Yes. Just, I, I'm feeling like um, we're missing a member who's very invested in this policy, so he's going to miss this conversation. I'm wondering if there's something else on our agenda that's shorter that we might be able to discuss first so he can actively participate in this. I don't, I know there it's is, out of What line. did you do before I got, I came late, I apologize. Um, we did um, our student report. We did the consent sure. agenda. There was no public comment. Right? I hold my the only thing we have left right. to do is reports other than that. Okay, we can. I did this to myself. We do. Where you in the uh, I don't know if that made it better. Because, I, it kind of depends yeah. on what you would want to hear. Do they want to hear the reports? Yeah. 
So I, I apologize. I just. I mean, we. I don't know. Yeah. I, I think I hear you. I do hear you, but it's a first reading, so there's going to be ample opportunity. And he certainly has not been. I mean, he gets his say when I, you know. So I'm not going to say you know you missed this part. You're not going to be able. To. Of course not. Yeah. Of course not. I just thought he might want to be an active participant in this, but he also will be able to watch the video of it. And Absolutely. it is, as you say, the first reading. Right. So um, if it comes to reiterating in a future meeting our rationale or whatever, mm -hmm. I think that as long as we're willing and open to that, because that's a fair point. This part he won't have participated in. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Sorry for interrupting. No. Um, the next paragraph, um, this is a quick one. I would get rid of the word also, and that's just readability. So the committee also notes all communication. I would just get rid of the word also. Um, and that's pure readability. I just don't think it's necessary. So looking to the next page where it says expectations of school committee members when using social media, I actually really like these. I think this really enumerates the challenge of being an elected official and using social media. So I really like these guidelines. I think they're very helpful, particularly um, for somebody newly elected. I think this is one I would actually really highlight to a newly elected member. Like here, you really need to be aware of open meeting law and how social media can, can interplay with that. There was one number that concerns me, and it's number six. Um, so and this is a little confusing because number seven is striked out. So beginning with the number six, um, it says posting to a private social media group or website is a bit riskier, but again, we need to look at intent. Is the intent to inform the public or have a private conversation? This doesn't read like policy. That's a question. Yeah. That this really doesn't read like policy. I'm very concerned about this. This is, I, I, would, I would strike posting to a private social media group or website is a bit riskier all the way through. Um, thus again, posting, posting with the intent of communicating to the public does not rise to deliberation so long as a quorum of the public body does not actively res respond to the same post. I, I would cut the, that because I just don't think it's clear. And it, it actually gets at one of the challenges of this policy is there is a lot of gray in this. But I think putting the gray into the policy doesn't help anybody. May I clarify something for the committee that I probably should have said at the beginning? The only piece that you, that will be an actual policy in your handbook is this First, first page, one. right? Oh, so what I'm reading under procedures. Those are all procedures. Uh, it doesn't mean More you can't change those, but they will not be in the policy handbook. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, then I only had two little edits to the policy. <laughs> 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 I'm corrected. Um, can, can I interject mm -hmm. into because I had a comment on the same, um, the same piece? Is that pr a productive way to? Can I just finish that point and then? Is that okay with you? Okay. So the very last, there is one sentence under there, and it's where the seven, the first seven is, striked, is struck out. Mm. It says, one can and should avoid the perception. I would actually keep that, mm. but I, that then becomes number six. So you delete number six, and number six becomes, one can and should avoid the perception of communicating to other members of a public body when posting to social media platforms. Does that? And it's a little yeah. confusing, but you, you're following? Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK. And I will pause there um, if Dr. Doxer wants to dive in in this section. Thank you. I actually took issue with that whole section because if the, the school committee, if other school committee members are on that um, page, then we are learning what that other person feels about it. And that means that six of us potentially are hearing someone discuss it, and we are not allowed by open meeting law to have sequential um, or communication with everybody else. That person that's posting is therefore posting and communicating with all the other five school committee members at the same time. Whether or not we are actively posting or not, we are actively reading mm. and processing. and. I think it's very clear that you don't have to be 
actively speaking or writing in order to be active in a conversation and learning and knowing it's taking you to a different place and that's what deliberations is about and so I'm not I'm not comfortable at all with having us post something actually other than what's already been I'm going out on a limb but something that's been published by the school committee as a statement or something that has been approved by minutes or a link to a, a school committee meeting or policy you know if it's if it's already been approved by the school committee that's very different than entering into a conversation and saying what one of us perceives to be fact mm -hmm and perceives to be the most important point that might have been derived from a conversation, even if it's the chair, because I think in the instance of the chair, they have to, it's not all the time that they should be speaking for the committee, it's only sometimes that they have to speak for the committee. Um, so I'm, I'm very uncomfortable with this and the denial that's part of the definition of deliberation in this. So, Mr. Robinson, yes. just, just a clarifying question. I, I heard everything that you just said. Are you proposing a different change than one the one I made, or are you agreeing? I just just for clarity. So, I'm agreeing with you, but I'm not yeah. comfortable with one can and should avoid the perception of communicating. I mean, yes, I guess you should. But it doesn't, it's not just by not directing the commentary to them and by not tagging, it's, it's the content that's posted. So I think my response to that is you're right. This is not the <laughs> only action you should avoid, but I do think yeah. this is an action you should avoid. So I, I'm, I'm comfortable with it because it's, you know, up above there's some other things you shouldn't do. But I, I do think that if I'm going to post something that's relevant to the schools and I tag each of you individually, that's very, that's even more problematic than some other right. behaviors. So I, I hear what okay. you're saying. I think what you're saying is there's so much more than this that's problematic, which I agree with. Mm -hmm. But as long as you agree that that is a problematic behavior, I think it's okay it to is have. A, I agree. It is a problematic yeah. behavior. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I mean, and there's I a lot here sense. and I'm thinking, I mean, it's not, it's, it isn't difficult. All we have, we, we should really skinny this down. This mm -hmm. the only thing that should be here, is state of fact, mm -hmm. yeah, the, of the committee, yeah. and not anything else. Yeah. Not not an opinion. Right. Not a not possible a opinion, or a potential opinion. <laughs> I'm I'm serious. No, so I, it has I to be fact. So yeah. in the past tense. Yeah. yeah. The committee voted five two yeah. on this issue. Yeah, and I <laughs> yeah I agree. Well, would it be five two. Five and to your point that it should be something we should define what a fact is and a Anything fact is by. something that has been accepted by the committee has been published by our administration you know if it's a response to a like miss kelly's um response to an email i mean that's that was published by our assistant superintendent i don't have a problem with republishing that as a fact but but not something that's generated new does that make sense you're looking puzzled responding to public question right that is is very problematic to me i think posting links posting meeting minutes posting things that we're already posting yeah. in other places is one thing when you go to respond to an individual question, it becomes an opinion because you don't know exactly how I would answer. I'm not going to assume I'm going to answer the same way Chuck would. And that's what worries me about a, a, the social I media mean, it, policy. It becomes particularly problematic during an election time. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because I can recall being up for an election where members of the public would want, you know, the candidates to weigh in. Well, I couldn't weigh in because I'd be speaking for the committee where the other candidates could. So there is guidelines mm -hmm. yeah. with regards to responding in your own 
opinion during an election year. Mm -hmm. So that is that is something that was covered under the release of what he put forth. Um, and I don't yeah. remember if it was the attorney general's guideline or whatever, but there was something in there that you can speak for yourself during an election year in a posting. So that's different mm -hmm. than posting as the committee. Yeah. But, it, uh, yeah. but that's the reality well. of it. I, and, very, and I know it, 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 yeah. in its intent, it's, it's, it's everything else, but it's, it's definitely, it was covered in the documents that were provided to us as to what the AG's opinion was. As an individual running for election, yes, I can respond to somebody with my own opinion. I cannot, as a non-running individual, post and say, I'm posting my own opinion here, hope my other five companions don't see it. Now, if two people start tagging on to that comment, that's where it might get a little bit sticky uh, because then it's open debate. So just to get you up to speed, well, it's the first reading, obviously. Yep. So and Gene uh, made some uh, friendly amendments, friendly <laughs> changes to the <coughs> policy. Very small changes. This is the first two pages, is the, or the first page is the policy, yeah. and then, then the, the uh, non policy. Versus the procedures? Versus okay. the procedures. So, uh, or do you want to quickly go through? The, the only I can watch it back. I mean, unless you feel like it's, sub if it's substantive, then I probably should hear it, but otherwise, I can watch it back. I think it, it would give you context, though. I think the first change is substantive. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. I will go through these. Sorry yeah. about so that. So if you start on Great concert, by the way, downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> what a tease. <laughs> so Dr. Docs that came to your defense said, so I'm bringing this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, bringing she did. This back up. She absolutely did. Um, but this is good, because I think we, mm -hmm. we can be efficient with this now. Right. Um, so on policy BH E-SM, the first paragraph, um, the final sentence, as such, to align with the goals outlined in policy KA, I, I'm proposing that we cut that entire sentence. I mean, I don't think it substantively changes the policy, but when you read KA, my rationale for it is when you read KA, it talks about what the school committee believes about communication, and then everything that's outlined is what the district will do. So there's really nothing in KA that says what the school committee will do. So I think it's just a little bit of a, I don't think it's an accurate reflection of what KA suggests. And I don't think it's substantive. It doesn't change anything in the policy. Um, so I would propose that. And my only other edit on that page <coughs> is removing the word also. Uh, the committee also notes that all communications, I, I don't think you need the word also. That was it. So where's the also? Um, second paragraph, third word. OK. All right, I've crossed it out for now, and then, then I'll go double check that KA just to make sure. Sure, absolutely. Just, just as a, a note, the intent was to make sure that the intent of the policy is proactive engagement, right? I mean, I think we've heard from this committee um, and its predecessors, inclusive of urine reviews and things like that, that social media can be a, a challenging place and sometimes the words like poisonous and things like that are put out there. So the intent here is to say we want to engage proactively, effectively, positively, right? That's, that was the reason why that portion of the sentence was put in there. Um, and we could, if we, we can strike the whole sentence, as you mentioned, or we could recast it to take out the KA reference or anything else like that if we agree that an intent is important. Um, if people don't think an intent is important, then that's fine too, I suppose. Um, but that's why it was in there. Okay. Okay, did you want to keep going? Keep going. With so then there's, there's something, this next part, my understanding is outside the policy. Right. This the procedures? Is, yes, yes. The procedures. So I'm recommending, or I'm suggesting that we cut, the way this reads to me, number six is very long. It includes number six and then what was the struck out number seven. Yeah, the, the it's a little change tracking got a little messed up between yeah. us and, and legal counsel. So I would suggest that number six, posting to a private social media group or website is a bit riskier, but again, we need to look at intent. Is the intent to form the public or have a private conversation? Proving that intent can be harder in a closed group, but it's still highly possible. 
I, I have to say when I read this, it's not a policy. That's a list of questions that aren't answered. Um, so I, the rest of it is very clear to me. You can do this, you shouldn't do this. You should avoid this, this is okay. This is so vague that I, I, I don't think it's helpful. So I would cut that from posting to a private social media group all the way to um, so long as a quorum of the public body does not actively respond to the same post. I would get rid of that whole chunk and then what I think is supposed to be number seven, I would renumber number six. And I would keep that. One can and should avoid the perception. I would keep that as number six. Okay, so it is, I think six is, by reading, reading the determination, six is important in some way, shape, or form. So I do think we, we want to be careful about striking it completely. And maybe we should wordsmith it a little bit. And the reason why I say that is, the determinations are, there was a very specific example where there was a private Facebook group. Um, it was about 500 or so members. And because it was private, it was raised as an issue to the DOG. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact, and this is where the correspondence back with the Attorney General shows up that you saw this morning, um, that was what the intent was, was to say, is it the private nature that's the important, or is it that I am intending to communicate with a broader audience. And so I think we can, I, I'm definitely in favor of rewording it because even going through this, it was challenging to try and figure out how best to say that. Um, but that is, that's what that, that sentence is. And this is not the policy portion, this is the procedure. So it's to inform ourselves and our future selves, right? Mm -hmm. What we should be trying to be careful of and do. Uh, as opposed to a policy, which is very different. And I want to give credit to legal counsel. This used to be one big, long policy, and she greatly helped and said, make the policy very short, and then take these things and make it a procedure that would help you, guide you, in terms of how you want to execute against the policy. And the other part about that is the policy is something we have to, you know, vote on on a go-forward basis, she mentioned, and the procedure is something we can change without an ongoing vote and public distribution and all that kind of fun so stuff. So I think if, if we leave six in there or some semblance of six in there it should say posting to a private media group or website is a bit riskier or or not even have that or posting to a private social media group or website should only relay the facts not opinions not potential opinions not potential facts only the facts past tense, I mean, it's like past tense, right? Things yeah, that already happened. Yeah. So facts, I think, uh, is covered in other places, and we can go back and double check well that. But I think what you can say is here is posting to private social media group or website should be solely with the intent of communicating with the greater public and not with the body. Communicating the facts. Communicating the facts or something along those lines. Not, I don't want to, yeah. Yeah, but Pushing back a little on that, I read a lot of the back and forth and some of these um, responses to open meeting law complaints, and it, it is very clear that they say exercise enormous caution. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I can, like, like yeah. very, very, very clear that this is the area of social media to be the most careful. So I think we need to be the most careful there. But it isn't just if it's a big group. It's also intent, which makes me extremely nervous that the guidance we're getting is if I intend to communicate a fact out to the broader community versus if I intend to make a statement that I really want my colleagues to read and this is the vehicle through which I'm doing it, I don't know how the AG's office is gonna know what my intent was. And that, I, I think it's an enormously, I think the reason that they, and I've got multiple quotes, they say again and again and again, school committees need to be very careful mm -hmm. about engaging on private social media groups is because of that exact issue. So. I'm, I'm maybe a little bit conservative in nature, but when something is as dangerous as that is, and something is going to put any committee member so Close. vulnerable to an open meeting law violation, my instinct is, so my next question then is, what's being done on that private media group that couldn't be hand, that, that's the right place to do it, that couldn't be handled in an open meeting, that couldn't be handled through an email to the committee or a phone call? Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. yeah. like if, if we're going to take that enormous risk as a committee mm -hmm. and we are going to make ourselves vulnerable to legitimate open meeting law complaints that we are, because it's going to come down to the intent of the poster, I guess I would want to know, well, why do we need to, why do we need to put ourselves at that risk? 
risk. So that I guess, is a, a question. I, my instinct is maybe we shouldn't be doing this thing that the AG's office is telling us is really, really dangerous to do. Mm -hmm. Great. And I don't, I don't have a good answer to that. Yep. Why is that a better place than an open meeting so, to give a fact? Let me go ahead. Um, to add to that, thank you. I also think that we have vehicles for information and we need to steer people to them. When a conversation starts on a social media platform like Facebook, then the conversations fold in and the ADL actually had the recommendation that you don't participate in those because what can happen is the opposition or people with a separate mission are given the platform to spread their alternative views and it's for every one comment by, it, I'll use my personal experience, it was a comment about um, anti-Semitism, then there can be 10 people that can reply to my comment. It gives them a platform to talk about that. If it were a school committee vote or discussion, then, and someone is giving something other than something voted on or decided by the committee, then they're opening a can of worms for the misinformation to fly because insinuations, they're going to be reading the other pieces. It's not a safe, as you were saying, a safe venue for us or forum for us to be starting, the, or appropriate, I would say, forum for us to be participating in. If we had, um, you know, we have a Twitter feed about things that happen, mm -hmm in our district. We're getting that from our, super, our assistant superintendent right now. That's different than us posting our, say, a picture of something where we are. We don't know who has, has permission for their pictures to be published or not. I, I, I left the forums a little bit, but I don't think it's our place to be doing that deliberation on these Facebook pages. So may I respond? Um, so first of all, this is not meant, and it should, and it goes to the point I heard as I was walking in, this is not an opinion, so you're not deliberating anything, right? You shouldn't engage in deliberation. You should, I mean, the, the point of the conversation is to engage in, in fact and convey what has happened or what is scheduled for an agenda or things like that. It's not meant to, you know, get into the morose of what's going on. Um, with that said, I would say that the other, si other side of this is we're not opening any can of worms when we do these things. Those cans are already open, right? I mean, those people are already saying what they're going to say, and every group that we have in Reading that is heavily involved in the schools is a private group. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the, let's face that fact as well, right? right? They all are private. And those were the specific examples provided to the AG as well as part of that conversation that we went through um, to see, all right, if the intent here is to communicate fact, I'm not going to jump into the deep end and communicate an opinion. I'm not going to tell you what I think. If we shouldn't ever be doing that. And, and if we want to say that as, as directly in the procedures, I'm all for saying those things as directly in the procedures. But we should be able to, as the public body that they elected to elected us for to respond with just fact and or we hear you you know it's something that we've we suggest as you say bring it to the principal bring it to the superintendent bring it to the assistant superintendent just cut off the conversation to a degree it's not a matter of what my opinion is or anything else along those lines right that's what we should very much avoid is opinion deliberation and 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 whatnot um, so I I, my view on it is, I think we can get a win if we say we're going to create, like the first one, we'll create a Twitter page or, or a Facebook page just for us to communicate what is going on for the school committee. I think the real win is when if, we, if we can start to communicate facts in threads that maybe are going sideways. And I think we spend, there's a lot of time that, that things happen and Dr. Doherty has to answer, you know, something that may be just not completely, not, not at all correct, just because it's just kind of spiraled on itself. That if somebody jumps in the middle and just stop, here's actually what happened. Here's the minutes of the meeting. Here's the, the video where the discussion happened. 
right? So you're not, no conjecture, it's just pure facts. And then you step away. And when they have the information, when they have the facts, it becomes, it should become less vitri vitriolic, for lack of a better word. And I think there's, there's proof of that. Wolverine has theirs. Ben, ben Saki has theirs. There's others that have their, their, their Facebook presences um, that are out there. Um, so it is what it is. But go ahead. Uh, Mr. Parks. I'd be very gun shy of looking at future meeting agendas because that is, if you're posting just the agenda, fine and dandy. If you're posting specific topics in the agenda, I would worry that that becomes a vehicle for comment. Mm -hmm. um, Where does it say that, that we're posting? I, no, well, Tom, Tom actually just With brought it up. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So I, I can't see doing anything future as far as let's talk about a specific agenda item in the future past I agree completely yes this this was a vote by the school committee five to this date here's the YouTube link that makes absolute yeah. sense right. to me right. future agenda items all six of us could see it and if there's any twist to it or there's one word off it can make it so that it changes an opinion and and I, I get what you're saying I agree that, you know, I would love to go in and comment on some of these threads. Have you reached out to the superintendent? Have you reached out to the high school principal? I think for me it's easier to, yep, mm -hmm. I'm safer not responding. Because once I state, even, even the fact, reach out to somebody here, that's my opinion on who they reach out to. Mm -hmm. it, it could be intended that way. I know it's stretching, Tom, right. yeah, but right. I, yeah. it could be an intent there. Like, you know, a, a hot button topic comes up about sports. Have you reached out to the athletic director? Well, if I'm not comfortable reaching out, well, that's your opinion. I should reach out to them. What happens if I want to reach out to the principal? Or So it, there's intent there to direct them in the right direction on who to talk to, but it still can be a perception. So and that, that does worry me. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So I think, and, and just to add to that, another challenge then is now you have individual school committee members engaging between parents and staff, which is completely inappropriate. That is not our job to be sort of that kind of go between. So I, I think that's an I think it's a good point. I think that's also inappropriate. Um, I had another point. Oh, I know what it was. On that topic, conversations online that go sideways. And I, I, I read a lot of this myself, full disclosure, so I sort of see some of the conversations happening. I think we could inadvertently create frustration in the community. Because I think there'll be a level of excitement, right? Yes, the school committee is going to engage on Facebook. They're going to answer our questions. They're going to you know, respond to rumors or information that we heard. Except when it has to do with staff. Except when it's about a particular student. Mm -hmm. Except when it's about contract negotiations. The list of things that we will never be able to discuss publicly is quite long. And I see a lot of that discussed on yeah. social media. And we know what our rules and boundaries are, but the public right. doesn't necessarily, nor should they. That they don't, we need to know, they don't need to know. But I think you could inadvertently create some real frustration of people saying, you said you were going to engage with us here, but you won't answer a question about, you know, I heard that X number of teachers from that building are leaving the district. And I heard that the reason this person was switched from this to that was this reason. We're just not going to be able to answer so many questions right. because of privacy laws. Yeah. I, would, I would add to that frustration in that if the public starts expecting us to be there, I can speak for myself. I have pulled back. I, I don't have time to keep up with everything that's on social media. And nor do I sometimes can I stomach what I read on social media. I'm just being honest. Um, and, and I feel upset that our staff is subjected to what's on social media. And I can't go up to defend anybody on social media. And yet, if we're assumed to be on social media, there's a different assumption about us 
not going to their defense. There's like that void where we're not allowed to be there, as you were saying, and so we're going to disappoint people by not rising to it. Yeah. When there was an accusation on social media, I was devastated because no one came, no one spoke up. I'm not going to go into more detail, but the absence of comment is as powerful as the comment sometimes. Right. And I don't know how a school committee member would have the capacity to keep up with all those pages. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we had our own page, maybe I'm opening, I, I, I heard you say if we had our own page, so we do, but we'd have to make sure that it was kept up and again, monitor, I mean, then we'd be accused of not publishing everybody's comments on that. We have one that was up that had a negative thing from, I think back from our previous superintendent that's never gone away and it's horrible. And it was one thought published many, many years ago and it's like permanent coloring whoever's, the ideas of whoever Googles it and gets that first. Yeah. So I, it's very, I'm not comfortable going there. Cool. And I think we need the rules prohibiting it. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Okay. I, mean, I can understand the, the desire to, Kind of squash things that go sideways but i do i mean i could see just in the the discussion the other night um about the fire and the situation like so many parents had questions that the principal couldn't answer and i can just i could see the frustration building there and to echo linda's idea i think the that would be a huge task if we have one to have somebody kind of be the administrator for that that will be a huge task right there if we have our own page and try to be watching count yeah i it's i understand the desire to do it, but I just think it does. It's like opening Pandora's box. I think it's more manageable to have our own. So if people want to dialogue, they got to come to us, mm -hmm. not us going out to all the separate uh, yeah. web pages. Yeah. Or, or and it's uh, easier to track and keep uh, record. Facebook groups have they'd have to come to our. Sorry. Yeah. Who was first? <laughs> I wanted to take the conversation in a little bit of a different direction because this is this has been a lot about things we're uncomfortable with. In I I want to say what I'm uncomfortable with is very much informed by open meeting law um, rulings. So I, this isn't just that I'm personally uncomfortable having read the complaints and how they're adjudicated. It, I'm coming from an informed place. My discomfort comes from an informed place, not a personal opinion. Um, but where I do think we have great room for improvement is in u utilizing social media to get, I think you said this, Mr. Parks, um, upcoming meeting, announcing the school committee's meeting on this date, at this location, at this time, here's the agenda, um, here are the minutes from previous meetings. I think that's a great opportunity to raise awareness in the community about our work and to encourage participation in these meetings, which I think we all agree is really important. So I like the idea of leveraging social media more. I'm less comfortable with the idea of an independent school committee page or Twitter handle for a number of reasons. One is that the sheer administration of it is an additional burden. We're volunteers. Um, we're not paid staff. So that's, that becomes a task um, that I think could be handled well by staff. I would further add that I think we've got maybe 1,500 followers on Twitter and Facebook right now at our, on our district social media. We kind of have a built-in audience. We don't have to start from zero. We've got active um, social media for the district. So I see no reason why those couldn't be the leveraged places for um, making sure school committee business is advertised, which I think is more efficient for parents. I'd rather have one place to go than multiple things to follow. Um, doesn't mean we, means we don't have to start from scratch. We, we get to just immediately leverage the existing base that's only gonna grow with followers. Um, and I, if I'm being blunt, there's a lot of tasks that we as elected officials are responsible for but don't do. Staff does. Like we don't assemble our own packet. Staff does that. We don't actually post our meetings. Staff does that. This, the, this strikes me as an administrative task that could be handled by staff on existing platforms. So, but I do think it's an absolute fair point that it's something we haven't done a good job with and could do way better at. Mr. Wise. So just a couple of things. There's a lot here to um, discuss, and I very, very, very much appreciate the discussion, right? I mean, 
having it is, is a big first step, right? Um, and if it doesn't go anywhere, it doesn't go anywhere. But at least we're having it and we're, you know, for lack of a better way to say it, we're, we're taking a, ch a shot at slaying the dragon. Um, Mr. Parks, to your point, uh, I think you can address the perception of, hey, go talk to Mr. Zaya, hey, go talk to the superintendent, by wording it in such a way, the protocol says, talk to X, Y, Z. And then it's not my opinion, it's not anything else. The protocol says, mm -hmm. talk to the building principal, if you're unhappy there, talk to the superintendent, you know, et cetera, right? So we can even boilerplate some of those answers, for lack of a better way to put it, right? And address some of those things. Um, <clears throat> You know, I think there is a, uh, a built-in portion currently in this procedure such that it is not a heavy lift for somebody or somebody's for a long period of time, right? It's, there's a built-in rotation into the process. Um, I think it's important, personally, that it does not become an administrative task from, you know, the, the quote-unquote, as, as sometimes the select board likes to say, the day staff, right? Um, I think it's important from the perspective of the community that they see us as their elected body available in that regard and, and that and and providing facts um, I think there was another point mr. Parks you raised or concerned about future agenda items what I meant to say is Ms. Engelson posts the the agenda on the two days before by law at that point we one of us can post from our page to share that uh, that future agenda item, which is two days ahead, not one that's two months ahead or, or things along those lines. Mm -hmm. So I'm even in, in okay. favor of, you know, tightening up the procedures, right? It's a first draft. It's a first, it's a, I tried to address as many of the DOG related issues as possible, but there's obviously our own concerns that we want to layer in on top of that. Um, I think we can also address things like there are things we cannot talk about, right? And just by law. And if you tell somebody, you know, According to FERPA, I cannot speak about this issue. According to employment law, I cannot speak about this issue, right? I mean, they may not like that answer, but it's a factual answer, and it, it's an answer, as opposed to something spinning around and just keep spinning. And I think that is, that is what happens, right? A lot of these things are started, maybe they're even started by somebody sharing factual information and somebody else comes in and spins around off that factual information. So I understand that concern, completely understand that concern. But that's where I think from my perspective, the way I'm viewing this is we can share our, our agendas, our minutes and links to the videos as a, as a nat natural share, right? And then when things spin out of control before for lack of a better way, sometimes they, they feel like, and I'm, I'm, I, f I don't think I'm the only one, they kind of feel like lynch mob type things happening. Before that starts happening, we kind of come in and, and quell the fire with facts. Or redirecting to the next meeting is X, Y, Z. Please come share your information in front of us at that point in time. It can be something that simple to sometimes bring those things to the bottom and, and, and minimize them. Um, again, uh, I have a different, I guess it's, it's also a little bit of a different risk tolerance, right? I mean, I think there's, there's that in place here as well. Um, you know, and it, it, it's colored, frankly, by the, the election season that we went through back in, in last year, where there was a lot of feedback in each one of the times when I was out meeting with the public about, you guys, you're not responsive, you're not available, you're not this. And, and, and I know that historically it's been, well, come to office hours, right? They're half an hour before the meeting. You know, I've now held, held them three times in my period here. I've had three people show up. Um, and it's sometimes just inconvenient. They can't get away. They're cooking, cooking things for their family, whatever it is. There's all sorts of reasons that there's a reason why social media grew the way it grew. And that's because it's, it's, it's somewhat a way of gathering and gathering information. And if we can insert ourselves in a positive way, and let's, let's put the rules, let's put the boundaries there insert ourselves in a positive way, we can influence in a positive way, as opposed to letting the influence negative continue to spin. Um, so that's that sense. I have another question about this proposal. So let's say a member of the community has a concern, and I post a fact that, and someone else in the community who likes to follow Facebook pages was out of town for three days and just unplugged. I'm concerned that you're going to end up having conversations 
that get lost in the nature of social media. Right now, if that happens, and I say, I heard a conversation, I heard there was an email to the school committee, it's a public records request. Like you can, all of that stuff is, there's law around it and it's stored and it's saved and we're protected in that way. This sounds like school committee members engaging with the public in a, in a private form, right? Not, not something that's accessible to everybody. With facts that, that's a discussion. A member of the community had a concern, now the school committee member brings a fact to answer it. <coughs> Members of the public might want to see that dialogue. And I don't know that Facebook or Twitter, and I legitimately don't know, I'm not a super savvy user of these um, mediums, but what's the, what's the method, all, what's the safety net for a member of the community who says, I heard that so-and-so in the community had a back and forth with this member of the school committee, and I would like to see that. How do, how do we, what's the storage, how do we store that? Right now it's email, so that's. Well, it's stored in your Twitter account, right? We have a. So Twitter yeah, account. and and by law, I'm the records access officer, but if I don't have access to it, I can't provide it. Right. So the pages that you manage, that's, you manage them. I have them. But if you're talking about private social media groups, none of us manage them. So I don't know how we would necessarily access somebody who says, you know, six months ago I heard a conversation happen, I'm now interested, I want a copy of that. I just, I really don't know what the law says on that. Yeah. yeah. And the, the responses are also often time bound with that folding in. I saw a wonderfully detailed response by a math teacher on one thread and it folded in so it was no longer found. It was under the misinformation. The answer got lost and then the conversation just continued. And how is a school committee member going to keep up with that? Just keep copying and pasting the same answer? Um, when you've already put it there. It's, I, I hear what you say and I agree. It's a dragon we have to slay. We have to tame. Engage. Yeah. I, I get that. Um. But to, to, I think, sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. What you're referring to is if we're putting the math teacher, for an example, put something on a private Facebook page, I assume, or Twitter. Yeah. Uh, if we limited it to putting stuff on our uh, our pages it's not going to get buried in uh, a bunch of other dialogue I don't if we don't that. allow comments but if we allow a conversation but if we need to go find it someone said we need right to that's, that's, the, that's the, yeah that keep one issue mm -hmm. right but if we allow comments then our our thread can be hijacked by misinformation and then people have to sort through what's the real information and what's not. I mean, I like the idea, uh, well, actually, I should say, the other, the other piece was we have to decide what our goal is. If we want to steer people to the right place, are we creating a competition for the district inf information? by creating another place to go. You mentioned posting the postings, the what um, Ms. Engelson posts. If we're no. posting them on our page, is that going to be the time someone has rather than going to where the source should be, to the pupil services page or the, the budget book or whatever it is? Are we distracting them from where the real information is? And we could put a link there. I think, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, I think this is where, and Chuck, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think this is where, as we get comfortable with certain things, we, we should put in place best practices. Um, you know, build on this procedure a little bit and say the best practice is to prefer, provide a link to the agenda, which we actually don't. Yeah, the agenda posted in the meeting minutes section of our page, which is an agenda, not meeting minutes, because they don't go there, right? Right. So 
that's the best practice not to copy it again you want to refer them back and then part of that is also building muscle memory for people they say oh I know that I went to that page and that that's where I got the information so I can go to that page to get the information right yeah. so it's you know one of the other things to that point is when we've heard it in other places some of our even more educated people around this town don't even know to go to that page to find the agendas right um, it is what it is right so part of that is that here's where are you now you are on RPN you are on you know PCAC parents concerned about curriculum you are on Reading parents supporting Reading public schools that's where you are that's where the people are gathering right here's the information and we can do a share from our page to go to that information and from that and be done with it if we want to um, in terms of the public records, I think that is a valid question, and I did not yet have the answer. Colby didn't add anything to that about public records when she was going through it. Um, I, the one thing I'm thinking as I go through this is our page, representing school committee, probably should fall into that. Our answers, even though we are the designated responder, I'm not sure if the answer to a question while the group is closed it's not closed because it's private right this is the problem with facebook it's private because they don't want to let advertisers in right not it's private because they don't want to let anybody in right so pretty much those groups all of them if you are a reading resident and you ask to join they'll let you in so it's it's not <coughs> it's not a matter of that it's it's just a matter of we don't want advertising all the time um but go ahead so I hear from a legal standpoint the issue of a closed group, but I would, I would, from a community perspective, I have other concerns in that a lot of people just don't use social media or mm -hmm. use one and not the other. So I just think we need to be really cognizant. You are not talking to the public when you're in a private Facebook group. You're talking with a self-selected small group of the public. And that's just, it's not the same. I would agree. Yeah. I would agree. But those same people aren't coming here either. So they're not missing anything, right? You're not giving them something, you're not, not giving them something that they're already getting, right? It's they're not missing anything because they're not coming here for this conversation either. Let's look at the room, right? <laughs> maybe they're watching on TV and maybe one of the things we could talk about is a liaison report is, a, is, an, up, is a, you know, an update on what happened in social media that, that period or something like that. That might be too much because then it's too much you know, summarizing. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm just trying to think about how to, how to close some of those gaps in a creative fashion to a degree. Yeah, I think the challenge with that too is there is an inherently uneven playing ground on social media when you're talking about it. Educators, administrators, teachers, and even elected officials, and members of the public. So a member of the public can post anything that they want. Mm -hmm. And it could be fully factual, it could be half factual, it could be fully factual but not provide really important context. And we can't respond to it. We can't say that isn't the full story of what happened. And so I don't know how you overcome that, but I think by engaging in that back and forth, you're communicating, this is, a, an, this is a, an even playing ground. You have questions, I have answers, sometimes I can't answer, but it's really not an even playing ground. So when you just meant, what I was thinking is, how would I, if I were that person, communicate out to the committee? I, I was looking at the social media threads and somebody wrote something that was just absolutely not true. I don't want to call someone a liar publicly. And I, mm. just, but that I, does happen, not often, but it does happen. Mm -hmm. There's a bit of decorum that we'd have to have about how we address those things. There was a concern raised in such a fashion. This is, this is where I referred them to meeting X, which you know something happened, right? I mean, so you you don't necessarily have to say, you know, Joe Schmo wrote something and twisted the facts and you know that kind of fun stuff. You could say there was a conversation. This was the general topic, and here's what I referred them to, right? You you can keep it very simple without calling somebody else. A liar if we if we choose to do it. Because the two specific examples that I'm thinking of involved a parent, and they go back some ways. They weren't very recent, but they were in my time on the committee. A parent reporting what they heard from their student happened at school, and it was outrageous. But it wasn't accurate. How is the school's committee supposed to respond to that? I, I mean, that's a legitimate question. I don't mm -hmm. know how we respond to that. I mean, I, I, in that particular case, if I, it was my turn on it, 
I would refer back to, to Mr. Parks's question of, have you brought this concern to the principal? Have you brought this concern to the teacher? Right? Um, and now the person answers that question. What's next? I, that's what I, I did. Just, and I, didn't I, I don't understand how we're <laughs> helping anyone yeah. in this. You're, you're going down a, a rabbit hole you don't want to chase. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, and where we don't belong. We, yeah. don't, we don't belong inserted between parents and teachers or parents and principals. We really don't. That We're governance over the whole district. We're not supposed to be in that position. Here's, I guess, uh, again, sorry, I'm sorry. We're just kind of engaging, so. That's fine. Um, so I, I think, well, I don't think we belong necessarily between. But I do think there are some parents who don't know what that protocol is. And you can say simply, I hear your concern. The protocol is to talk to your teacher. If you're un unhappy there, talk to the principal. If you're unhappy there, talk to the superintendent. Please follow the protocol. And that can, that can be the stopping of where you engage. And if they want to keep going down the path, they can keep going the, down the path, but at least we provided, as we've been asked to do in many cases, direction of have you followed the steps that are appropriate and requested. A lot of, a lot of parents don't know that those are the requested steps. I mean, it's let's it's rea it's a reality whether we want to admit it or not. That's that's so we're not insert inserting as much as providing a bit of guidance and direction. Can I can I follow that example a little farther? Mm -hmm. Then what do you do when the response, like Mr. Park said, is I tried that, so that I want the school committee involved. Where else do I go? I tried that. We have no idea if it's true. We don't know really anything necessarily about the person that's saying it. We don't even know if the person is the person that's saying it on social media. Yes. Sadly true. So where do we go then? And it gives them a forum to attack in public. And I know you're. I, I don't share the view of those private groups um, just keeping out advertisers. I've heard about people being blocked if people didn't like what they were saying on that page or people being attacked for speaking other than what was desired or, or expected on those pages. So I, I don't... So I think, I think we need to establish what we want to use the social media for. Right. And, you know, we're talking about two different very different things one is is Response. getting into dialogues about situations and the other is the posting you know minutes and district improvement whatever right. you know right. uh, yep. so uh, you know I think the the latter is what I'll call the low-hanging fruit you know that that question is a lot easier to answer that uh, we can easily say that we want to establish something to put up the, the mm -hmm. information that people know they can go one place to get it from the mm -hmm. source uh, and the other thing I think is a, a, a trickier conversation you know and, and, we can and I think you, you we get into that a little bit where you have the monitors or the, the uh, and you know I guess that that do we want to go do that I mean I'm, I'm not saying I don't or I do I just that I think that's a separate discussion yeah. I think that's a you know potentially good way to to guide the next round of conversations right yeah. you know let's maybe maybe this group will agree as a committee to to attack the low-hanging fruit now right and and that's as I said that's a step that's a win for all of us, I think it's not. It's not has nothing to do with personal, right? It, but then we have maybe there's a subcommittee that says, how would we want to? Would we want to address or not address um, the other thing and provide a recommendation for procedure number two, right? Maybe this one becomes this is the overall policy. The procedure is how do we execute that policy and proceed? This procedure in particular focuses on our own Facebook <coughs> page, Twitter feed where we're pushing information and not responding for the time being. Um, and, and if that's the compromise, that's a compromise. Um, and we work our way from there. I, I, I have one other thing. And in, 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 the, in here it's saying two members working 
together in a certain time frame while informing the chair. That worries me. That's three people out of four that you need for a quorum. Yeah. So I'd really like to see that, you know, even if we do just links for now, I'd like to see that drop to one with chair approval. That's two, and, and you've got some safety net there. Um, and, and I'd offer that friendly. Not, not that I want to see, you know, us go down this full rabbit hole, but I think having one person post a link or a YouTube video or something like that that is fact, already accepted by the committee, is much safer than <coughs> two with chair approval. Um, one with chair approval. Yeah, I think before we get to that yep. point, gee, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Before we get to that level of the discussion, I think the next step is to talk about, we, we already know that there is a Twitter page that, that yep. we have and a Facebook page. And I think in my mind, I'm at the discussion point now that we want to take those over as a committee and manage them or continue managing them the way we are right so that's right yep. is it uh, yeah I, I i definitely felt consensus yeah. around agendas meeting minutes and advertising mm -hmm. meetings mm -hmm. I, I feel like there's real consensus that that is something we would like to do more of we'd like to do consistently on social media so yep. and the only adjustment i would make and i think and maybe dr dory wants to speak on that too I don't know if we want to take over theirs as okay. I think he's been using it as a platform that's pushing out the pathways and quite a few other things, which are really more focused on what the administration team are doing. Yeah. As opposed to what we're discussing or what our agenda items are. I think they are two separate things. But if he wants to keep it I mean if he wants to give it to us, fine, but I think I was thinking it was two separate things. Not in competition, augmenting each other, but with our specific focus items and goals. Uh that that's a good point. I guess I was, what, what I meant by that was do we want to be more active in the content that goes on the, those, you know, I think there's a web, uh, Facebook page now, right? And yep. there's also a Twitter. Yeah, there's Facebook, Twitter, and a blog. Uh, so, you know, we could certainly, you know, one thing is either have our own or uh, assign ourselves a task to put our stuff on that those pages so that that's what I meant mm -hmm. not not take it over and, and <laughs> kick kick off all the stuff that, that everyone's putting on there now did you want I just want to make two well question and a point um, to the point of the Facebook page slash Twitter the duplication of effort concerns me um, because if it's which I started doing a couple months ago when I was asked to if it's a matter of just posting packets agendas things like that that's already happening so if that's the only purpose of creating the only your own Facebook pages and things like that then to me that's a duplication of effort the second piece I would suggest you got counsel to take a look at the wording. I don't know if you got counsel to weigh in on the opinion of whether or not you should have one. And I think you should do that. So when I originally sent this, well, Tom sent it to you know me information and I forwarded it on to Colby I thought it was implied by her responding to it and, and wordsmithing it that that she agreed with it my understanding it is it was not she was she was merely putting the red line to the policies that were put in front of her because I asked her the question she had not weighed in on an opinion on it Okay. So you may want to go that route also to help in better. Well, I didn't just send her. In. First of all, I don't just send people emails. I pick up the phone and I actually talk to her about it, and she uh, th that it was coming. 
Uh, and she did say, and now this is over the summer, I guess. Uh, she did say that, you know, other districts do have uh, these policies and, and. Correct. She uh, was, she, she was very comfortable with the policy. Yeah. What she was uncomfortable with was the procedures. That was the conversation I had with her when I kind of took over this task. Okay. I can certainly uh, reconvene with her. Uh, yes, John. If, if we're going down the where the district's already posting this information, I think this. I like the idea of that. I would like to see it built out further. Absolutely. Um, as far as I'd love to see the principal's newsletters online with the district. Things like that where everybody can go to one spot and say, I go to, my kids go to Barrows, here are all the principal's newsletters. Quick, easy, done, I know where it is. Instead of looking for schools to post and email and things like that, if it's all in one location, it's quick, easy, done. I'm not opposed to the school committee having a Facebook page and posting that information, but if it's already being done and it's being managed by the person that is in charge of housing records, it's also easier to find anything that was posted, which that's a worry for me because I'm not going to go on as an individual to the school committee site log in with my own stuff, make a comment, because my own page now becomes public record. Just like if I send an email from my home email to the committee, I'm making that email address public record. That worries me a little bit, um, and I hadn't thought of that until tonight, yeah. or, or I definitely would have brought that up earlier. Um, so it would be either creating one account that we all log into that's separate from our own personal and it's Reading School Committee, not John Parks posting as Reading School Committee. Well, you or already, allowing the no, district so you already it. have a, you, sh you have a uh, Reading uh, email address. Yes. So, but what I'm, what I'm saying is it's just like doing an email. So if I'm using my personal email and I decide to send Chris, Dr. Doherty, and you an email, not thinking that, oh, I'm on my home email, that email is public record. Mm. Yeah. Well, that, that's, you know, that's uh, but I'm just saying on you because it, I agree you to go on the, uh, go on the Reading webs, go on your Reading email and yep. send it from there. I agree completely, but it, yeah. it's just opening up Facebook for the same thing. As an individual, my Facebook account becomes public record, just like my email account would. I think that's, I don't think that's proven to be true yet. I, in fact, I know with email it is. Email, email is, so here's the intent difference between email and social media. And it somewhat goes to one of the earlier questions as well. Email is specifically and focusedly directed at just the people that are going to receive that. And nobody else has any means to get access to it. Social media is not that. And in fact, Twitter, you can go search right now and see what anybody posted on Twitter. It's, unless they've privated their account, which we wouldn't do, they would, you can see anything you want to see from what anybody posted ever, ever. Facebook, you can do a lot of that except for the private information and if you go into the private group as well. But it's, not, it's inherently not a private communication forum. So if you go back and read those DOG documents, they all start with the intent. Mm -hmm. The whole thing of the intent of open meeting law is to avoid backroom deals and avoid private conversations. Mm -hmm. and, and the point of the social media stuff, it's not intended to be a private conversation. It's not intended to be a backroom deal. It's intended, again, that's why I put so much focus on intent in those conversations. It's intended to be public information. And that, that's why it's very, very different between an email being public record and, and social media, Facebook, Twitter, public record conversations. I think I'd want to weigh in, but. But I do think it's, it's worth definitely asking 
our attorney to weigh in on where the line of public record is. I think that's a very, very valid question. Um, there's much less case law, for lack of a better way to say it, on public record than there is on open meeting law, mm -hmm. much less. In fact, I had a very, very hard time finding it. I couldn't find any. Um, but it's new ground. Right. It's not. It's very old ground. It, well, as far as social media, it's it's how it's twenty five years and, old, yeah. right? But it, we don't have case law on how it's up cap. We don't have how it's stored. Right. I mean, are we going to require Dr. Doherty to go in and print screen? Yep. You know what I mean. So there's yeah. worries there. Yeah. I like the intent. I, I truly yeah. like the intent of, and the idea of doing this. I think there's more to weigh out. Jean? So I was just wondering in how we're going to move forward from here. Could we maybe have a discussion about the two proposed changes to the policy I recommended? See if there's any other proposed changes to the policy. That would get us to the second reading next week. And then just take the whole procedure thing offline. So it's like there's a desire to run that through the attorney. Does that make sense? Like just deal with the procedure separate? Yeah, oh, yeah, I don't know the procedures are we'll just separate. Do them separate. Okay. Yeah. I, just, I don't think I understood that. Did, did uh, any other changes to the policy or proposed changes? Not I mean, the only thing I would say is I wanted to go back and look at that, what Gene was saying, but I've got, it's got it stricken out right now. and. And it's prepared uh, to a degree for the second reading in that regard, but I'll just double check that ahead of time. We can certainly that, go back to it in the second reading. Yep. yep. Okay. Thank you. And I'll uh, reconvene with Colby or with our council. Anything else? No. Do you need to move anything? No. Because we're, uh, we already voted to do the first reading, which we did, which. No, you didn't vote. No, we didn't vote. A we motion was made, but you didn't vote. Oh, right. Did we move and second? I think we did. I thought we, we moved and seconded. Second. <laughs> did we move and second? I think yes. we So we moved and second, but we haven't voted. So what was, the, mo what was the motion? We wouldn't vote tonight. Correct. Move to accept the first reading. We just have to vote to accept oh, right, the first right, reading. Right. Yeah. Oh, any other discussion? All those in favor? Six zero. Can I point of clarification? Yes. We can have as many readings as we determine are necessary, correct? Or we can postpone the sec no, I think we can only have the two readings. You can yeah, you can we, post we can postpone the second reading in favor of just having a dialogue and not voting that mm -hmm. night. So, you know, maybe at the next meeting there'll be more information where we can continue the discussion on and and delay the vote for another meeting. Okay. That's, that's how I've always yes, done it. Yes, yeah. that's correct. You could continue it, right? Yeah. yeah. So you could have the second reading and then continue it. Right. Kind of go to old business at that point in time. All right. Uh, on the agenda here. So we're just down to reports yep. now. Uh, so you want to? Uh, we can start with. You still awake down there? I am. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Jen? So um, I'm going to just report out on the CPAC meeting that happened earlier this week. Uh, we had a guest speaker from the state, Andrew McKenzie, and he is leading us through our tiered um, focus monitoring process. And he did a lot of explaining about what is the process and really emphasize that it is it is a collaborative process it's really just to improve our compliance and what we're doing and, and working together 
Um, they will be sending out a survey to all parents of students who are on current active IEPs on Monday, barring any weather or um, technical difficulties. And um, so parents should expect something. It will probably come from DESE um, and will go directly to the parents. It's just a survey with um, information that the state will consider when they're um, gathering data. Um, and then the state will be out in that first week in January when we return from winter break to um, do file reviews. We just got the names of the files today and we'll be um, participating in that and they'll also be doing some interviews. So we learned about that information. Um, I reviewed there's been a lot of questions and concerns about making sure we are reviewing our sub separate programs and um, our instructional practices and so I was able to talk about some surveys that we're going to be doing after the new year to make sure we're getting feedback from the community um, and parents and teachers around um, our pro current program descriptions, making sure that, that they do provide the accurate information and that we're really looking at that instructional what is happening in our programs and in all of the services that we're providing so we know all children are um, receiving um, the appropriate supports. Um, Understanding disabilities came and just asked if they could um, have any help or donations of time or money and that they are going to be doing some partnering work with the CPAC to really get that message out there. Um, and I did reach out um, to the CPAC today just to confirm the next few meetings because we did have a nice turnout and they really are looking to continue to build membership and partnerships. So the next meeting is January 14th at 7 o'clock in this room. It's a general meeting. On February 11th at 7 o'clock, there's going to be a representative from the Federation of Children with Special Needs, and they're going to talk about um, a basic rights presentation on understanding the IEP. And then they're trying something new. On Wednesday, February 26th at 10 o'clock, they're going to do a general meeting at the public library just to give uh, opportunity for maybe people who can't come to a night meeting to attend a meeting. And so we're really going to be just working to get the word out so that there's a supportive group. And there was also some discussion about maybe building partnerships for new families, either into the district, into programs, into schools. And we're going to be working on that piece um, as well as a whole district initiative. That sounds like an excellent idea, though, yeah. about that last meeting. You know, yeah, and I think that MECO is, it, it was great because um, Superintendent Doherty and um, Assistant Superintendent Kelly were at the meeting and were able to talk about MECO's doing some things like that and really making sure that we have a universal approach to welcoming families and students into buildings, um, which was really, really nice. I have two relatively quick items just to sort of dovetail a little bit on what Principal Boynton was talking about surrounding the security. There were a couple of questions that did come out last night at um, the open meeting that Principal Boynton had regarding the cameras in the high school and we heard a lot of questions and comments that the high school actually does not have cameras and if we did they are not working so we just wanted to clarify for the committee that the high school does in fact have cameras and they are in fact operational. There is no issue with that. While there may not be cameras in every single location that people would want them to be, we do have cameras in the high school that are functional, that we utilize all the time. Um, we also did want to remind the committee, I know it's been a little while since we've done a full capital update, that we are continuing to work on the town and school wide security projects. It did come up last week at the select board meeting. The chair of the select board asked as we were doing the presentations um, for an update. We did let that committee know and we'll let this committee know that we are meeting with 
um, Dr. Doherty, Deputy Chief Clark, and the town manager next Wednesday. We have a nice three hour marathon meeting scheduled update. to update them on where we are with the project, Brief. next steps going forth I with how we're planning on doing the RFP process, which will be starting in January. So it is still moving along, and then we'll be determining what the next steps are from public updates in meetings. So we did want to let folks know that we did hear the questions last night, and we do continue to work on that. And cameras are obviously part of the overall project, but we're not going to give specifics at this right. point. The other item that we did want to say in the same vein as the crisis planning, we do work very closely with other districts. And next Wednesday, which John will actually be attending because we'll be getting ready for um, the security meeting, that there is a Massachusetts School Safety Initiative meeting taking place that has representatives from Secret Service, FBI, Homeland Security, Mass Office of Public Safety and Security, Mass Partnership for Youth, State Police, Public Safety, as well as private industry. The goal of the meeting is to understand the resources, protocols, and the way in which public and private partnerships can collaborate using proving methods to reduce and ideally eliminate behaviors that expose students, schools, as well as education and law enforcement professionals to risk. So we are participating in this um, and as more meetings come out we will be ensuring that we have representatives from the school attending them so we did want people to know that we are participating in as many forums as possible thank you Ms. Kelly um, so thank you uh, I'll be quick I have a few things to say since our last meeting um, we had a district-wide professional development day on the conference day. So when um, parents and high school teachers and elementary teachers and parents of elementary were busy conferring, we took that opportunity. Uh, the middle school principals led their teams through some awesome PD that day, um, curriculum-based and a lot of activity work, which is very exciting. Um, in addition, we train, we take that as a day to train our paraprofessionals. Um, this year we partnered, I partnered with uh, Dr. Stice and her team and we looked at surveys from a few years ago of just what paraprofessionals wanted to be trained in and what they felt were emergency needs and they came under themes such as uh, safety, um, dealing with students who may be in trauma or have anxiety, um, obviously special ed practices and inclusive best practice technology um, and also CPR training mm -hmm. so we were able to have uh, over 16 different workshops that day uh, could not have happened without Dr. Stice's amazing team the nurses did a CPR training um, all of the team chairs led something we had um, really a very robust PD and the, the uh, surveying that we did was very exciting. The parents were very um, excited about it, so thank you. <laughs> um, in addition, on that vein, um, uh, we do have a professional development committee um, that meets regularly. We are in the process of doing an environmental scan of our PD practices and we will be sending out surveys to all of our teams asking for their feedback on just what they'd like to see. Um, we've done a lot of reframing and rebranding of our professional development in Reading and we're getting some real traction. So that's really exciting. This professional development committee, hopefully, will be coming up with a three to five year plan on what that will be looking like. So we're excited about that. Um, and, and towards that vein of taking some real traction, I just wanna uh, publicly salute some of the work that's being done. Um, as uh, Kate mentioned when she talked about being at a conference, we had a, a robust team going to the Medco conference. The Medco directors always do a fabulous job. Um, in addition, uh, five of us were at um, a conference on the Cape around Title I and leadership around that and working with students who may need a little bit more support um, based on their eco economically disadvantaged status. So that was very exciting. Um, this week, Heather Leonard is conducting PD at the Museum of Science for third, fourth, and fifth grade teachers on uh, phenomena based instruction, which is really that aha of science and hooking kids and really saying, like, how is this exciting and why is this important to you? 
I just want to, again, I know we've said a lot about commending um, the school committee and also our our taxpayers. The No Adam curriculum has really invigorated our work. Um, and a, a huge shout out to uh, Mrs. Leonard and the work she's done around that, as well as building principles. Um, I was able to go today to the Museum of Science, and it was so exciting to watch our fifth grade teams there. Uh, also, what an incredible resource we have in the Museum of Science. Mm -hmm. They offered us space to use for professional development. They offered us in-house expertise. They offered us free use of the museum and free parking. Like, you don't even get it better than that. So thank you for that. Um, we also are getting some really great feedback on our literacy trainings that we continue to have with grade level teams with our um, humanities uh, coordinator, Allison Straker. So that's really starting to, to take hold. Um, she had a great session with first grade this week and I uh, had the opportunity to be housed in one of the buildings and, and every single person who talked to me talked about PD and how excited they are. Um, so I just wanna say that that's just been a great, um, it's been a great week to hear that. We, we've we been working at it for about a year and a half and, and to hear sort of, you know, out of the mouths of the teachers saying thank you so much. This feels really good. So we're getting there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dar. I have two items. Mm -hmm. uh, in your packet is the North Shore Education Consortium Annual Report. Uh, under the collaborative agreement, uh, they are both of our collaboratives have to provide an annual report. Uh, I believe I will see seams next week. Yeah. So the board of directors do approve it after after we review it, and we reviewed this last week uh, with the executive director, approved it, and then um, we're required to give it to the different school committees in each in each district. So you could see by the table of contents, uh, it pretty much gives a snapshot of all the different programs that are offered at North Shore, um, and the goals, the mission, the vision, things like that. The page I want to refer you to, and we've talked about this before, is the cost effectiveness, which is the page labeled 19 uh, in the annual report. So what you see um, are the programs that are offered by North Shore for members and non-members. We are a member. We pay dues as part of, um, and we, we get the membership rate. But then you also see other, the private uh, school uh, that offer for those different disabilities and what they charge for their daily rate. So you could see that um, by, by being a part of these two collaboratives and seeing you'll see something similar, I believe, next week, you, you see how we have a cost savings by having our students go to these types of programs uh, versus a, a more private placement. Uh, so whenever possible, if we do have to send a, a child out of district for a particular disability, um, we certainly look at a collaborative as a first option if, uh, if the program is available. So I wanted to point that out to you um, as part of the annual report. The other piece that I wanted to bring up is uh, kindergarten registration um, had its first deadline, and I call it the first deadline because now the second deadline is to try to find all of the, the families that we're aware of that are in the census that did not respond, and now we have to uh, figure out if they still live in Reading, um, and if they do, you know, are, there, are they going to be registering their child for kindergarten? So the first deadline was last Friday. At this point, we have 231 students registered for next year which is a little low, but the census did show that this <coughs> grade the coming in was a little bit lower than the, the previous ones. Um, there are still 75 children out there in the census that uh, did not <coughs> turn in an application. So now uh, Mrs. Engelson is working with the secretaries in each school to try to identify those families to see what their status is. 209 currently have chosen full day, 22 have chosen half day. So that's where we're at, and I'll continue to give updates as we move, go along. Uh, <coughs> I think I'll be relatively brief. Um, select board, uh, a couple of, th you know, the budget meetings are going on. Um, Joe Huggins presented on behalf of really on his town side thing, but he referred a little bit to the school side stuff, and 
in particular showed all the savings that would is, was achieved through the uh, energy management. what's that the performance performance management, management stuff um, and it's more than what was promised it's quite impressive if you actually look at that I think it's at the bottom of our packet yeah um, so he did a great job there um, so I just wanted to recognize that as well um, I think one thing that was the CPAC meeting one thing that was <coughs> missed well technically not my uh, thing there there the January 14th meeting is also a special presentation it's the role of the CPAC special presentation so if anybody's interested in that um, that one will be that meeting um, and as I was listening and thinking about the understanding disabilities portion afterwards and I think this is more of a question that we can mull potentially that is a hugely important in my opinion um, organization within Reading our CASA was a hugely important organization in Reading I'm wondering if there is a parallel path there from a, a community priority type conversation to have um, neither one is either, each one of them is its own private organization technically under the law but our cost is publicly supported um, yeah, so that that that's actually a conversation we can have at probably is we've we've support we've always supported understanding disabilities and we've in the past when they've come to us for help uh, why are you looking at me like we have no 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 I was a, a <coughs> was going to refer to his comment the difference with our CASA is funded under the police department and had always had staffing under the police department okay. whereas understanding disabilities is not in the operational budget but we have uh, supported them in the past when they've come to us uh, we can have that that we uh, um, I don't know I think you were superintendent then uh, no it was when I was Paula not superintendent Tucci was was was, was well we have so uh, we, we can yeah. we I mean I, so maybe I guess my point is maybe during the budget season we can have a conversation with finance committee select board whoever the appropriate party is to see if that's something they, they've essentially said their operating budget is is relatively meager at twenty thousand dollars yeah right um, and I think there was a great idea that one of the members maybe it was Chris was it you I, I forget who it was but comparing to Newton who pays a good amount of money for somebody else to come in and do those products is there a cost benefit there for Reading as a whole but I think it's just something for us to think about as we go into the budget season I don't know whether we can so this is just throwing an idea out there but I, I think it's worth considering if possible um, so there's that and I obviously I, I had to leave apologies for leaving for half an hour but the chorus was phenomenal as they always are mrs. Wentland has really kind of stepped in uh, I know that she values Kristen Killian and all the work she did and they ended with the classic song that they always end with let the river run um, so you know just kudos to them and I very much appreciate it uh, just a, a few things uh, dr. Doherty and I uh, were part of I think it was all, almost all day uh, the assessment center oh yeah yeah for the because uh, uh, we haven't met for a while this is back before Thanksgiving the assessment center for the for the chief of police and there were five candidates uh, very very uh, very interesting and I think very good process uh, I don't know I really can't say much about it but uh, just to say that you know uh, it's in the town manager's hands at this point so but it was good well I was very proud to be there and I thought it was a good process the the other uh, thing I wanted to mention is uh, one of our colleagues uh, former colleagues uh, Gary Nyan was recognized went to the Hall of Fame dinner and he was recognized there uh, that was right before Thanksgiving as the Cliff Allen award winner and I don't have a write-up on the but it's base it's Cliff Allen had an untimely death uh, and they named this award he's a tremendous volunteer in town I didn't know him personally but you some of you guys may have I think he might have been on the school committee he was. at one time he was uh, and so Gary was recognized as a volunteer 
uh, where he, as a coach, volunteer in, in youth sports and as for the things he did as a uh, teacher and coach at the, at the high school level. So it was a nice event. Uh, the other thing I went to, and Dr. Daugherty was there as well, was the uh, football luncheon before Thanksgiving. And you know, I thought it was a great event. Oh, and, and your, your husband was he? I was you there. were there. <laughs> 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 uh, I just, I, you know, I only bring it up because I just, and I said this that day, uh, you know, our kids hit it out of the park. Okay. I His mean, they, they, the 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 uh, captains gave a gave a little speech, and and each of them, and boy, did they! I mean, I was just proud of them. They, you know, they they talked about uh, a certain. They had each had a certain topic that they talked about, and they did very, just just made us proud. I think so. Anyway, all good stuff, right? Um, no, I was unable to attend the CPAC meeting earlier this week um, because I had two performers Sorry, at the Parker Chris. Music Concert, which was phenomenal. Um, but I'm very grateful to the board, reached out. They completely understood the conflict. And uh, thank you to Dr. Styes for covering the report this evening. Um, I have a report for RACASA. The work continues on the new organization of RACASA. The new name, structure, and logo will be revealed soon. Was It hasn't been revealed to the... Um, no. I believe after December's meeting. Yeah. Okay, which is next week, I think. Yes, I think so. Yeah. Um, so at that point, it will be presented to the select board of the town. Um, they continue with their mental health first aid training. They've reached over 679 people in the district at this point. And it's required every year now for the new teachers. They're continuing to certify new staff. Um, every person certified helps our district become more informed and sensitive to the me mental health needs and manifestations through youth and adults. It's really, really impressive and important work. Um, their new um, outreach coordinator, Sammy, and I lost her last name in my recesses. Sammy's last name. I don't remember it either. Mm -hmm. with an S. Yeah, I'm drawing Salkins. a blank. I'm sorry. I just saw her at the Sawkins. Sawkins. Thank you. Sawkins. Thank you. Um, she's working with a lot of students with diversion programs and helping them deal with issues. Um, another example of how our district doesn't um, just do discipline, it works with students to help them deal with issues and create a better potential from mistakes that might have been made or, or medical needs that have happened. Um, they're putting together a YRBS data team right now, and they're also rebooting a peer leader group through the um, RACASA, which is really exciting, having had two kids who are alumni of past peer group leader groups. Um, at the time of that meeting on December 18th, no, that's today. Um, the, the meeting was three weeks ago. Um, Espert at that time was almost done with freshmen and juniors were about to start. Sammy had started training so that she couldn't be a full participating member supporting the nurse with the Espert process. Um, we have a new interim director of nurses who was actually there last night at the presentation as well. Um, and she's making connections between kids and staff. Um, and vaping prevention has been ongoing in the middle schools and they're bringing high schoolers with them to reach the middle schoolers to deal with a real issue um, in our society and, and our schools. That's RACASA. And then RCTV, um, they're actually having their holiday party tonight. Um, they are a fun group, really nice group to work with. Um, and they're just so invested in the work they do in the town and with our kids. It's, it's really nice to see. Um, they're working on transitioning from their old funding and organization process to their new budgeting process. So part of the meeting was about that. 
Um, and they also have been very busy recording events. By the way, thank you, RCTV, for recording us and enabling <laughs> us to get the word out. Um, they're doing ho holiday events. Um, they did a lot of events, the, um, the Festival of Trees, Community Singers, Parker Tavern Open House. They're sponsoring a Colonial Chorus radio of Miracle on 34th Street. It's a big fundraiser for Colonial Chorus, so they're really enabling them um, to make headway with that, which is important. And there's no copyright on it, so they're recording it, and they'll be um, showing it on TV. Uh, okay, December 6th, 7th, and 8th. It was on TV. <laughs> it might be still shown, so check their um, check their lineup. But it was very exciting to be I'm a not part of it. The only one that's getting. <laughs> <laughs> it's really late. Going back in time. <laughs> um, they did babysitting for Shop the Block to enable all those people I was outside with and in the stores with. Um, and Katie was doing interviews with shoppers that night. Um, and I'm trying to be short. They, they're just so busy in everything and they're engaging our students and teaching our students and empowering our students to be professionals as students. Um, and I've met them and I've talked to so many of them and I'm continually impressed with their knowledge of what they're doing, the, the um, technology, and enabling the word and the programs to get out. Thank you. Uh, I attended the um, Ad Hoc Committee for the Human Rights Organization on uh, the 26th of November. Um, at that meeting, they uh, refined and finalized the mission statement for the organization and started to discuss how the organization should be structured and where within the town it might be housed. Um, locations ha that have been considered were uh, under the library and other human services, but that's still an ongoing discussion. Um, some of the structures that they proposed included a town bylaw established committee, a town department established committee, and then a committee that would be established by multiple boards. That that one seems a little messy. So uh, each option had some pros and cons with it um, with respect to staffing, autonomy of the group, um, ability to fundraise, um, ability to respond quickly to any incidents that might need to be addressed. So there's still a lot of going um, ongoing discussion, but the Committee members seem to be leaning toward the second option, having a committee that's established by a town department, similar to what our CASA is doing. Um, and in any format, the committee felt that it was really important that the, the, uh, there be a salaried director of this organization. So a final decision hasn't been, re hasn't been reached, and members adjourned with instruction to consider what their priorities were for the organization. Um, and more discussion will come soon. Um, we're looking at uh, reconvening in January. Um, and then also th that evening, uh, plans were discussed to host a table at the town's Martin Luther King Day celebration, with the purpose being to provide an update on the committee's progress um, and to serve a place to collect stories from community members that wish to share any regarding their own experiences. And we're going to partner with the World of Difference program here, Ellie Lynch. We're in process of working on that. Thank you. Uh, Rec committees met twice now since our last meeting. Um, the only real major thing to come out of it was the email that was sent in regards to the softball fields. That work started back in August with Jenna and Tom. There was a timeline set. All of that work as of the day prior to the select board meeting had already been com completed. So the fencing is up, the benches have been moved, all that safety work has been completed at this time. Oh, good. May I? Yes. Before we adjourn? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to take a, a brief moment to make a public announcement to my colleagues on the school committee, Dr. Doherty and his staff, and anyone in the public who might be interested. 
Um, I've spent the last several months reflecting a lot on my service to this town and um, the upcoming election. I've had a lot of long conversations with my husband and my two kids. Um, and I have come to the decision that I will not stand for re-election to the school committee this spring. Um, I just wanted to make that publicly known. Um, it is definitely the right decision for me and my family, but I'll say it's bittersweet. I'm really going to miss the work that we do here, and I'm going to miss working with all of you. Um, but I am really looking forward to budget season, and you're stuck with me for a few more months. So, um, <laughs> Thank you. And I believe Dr. Doxer also wanted to say something. I do. And I'm, um, I have an apology to make to our chair, because you were on my list of phone calls to make. No. And I apologize that I didn't. Um, I have to reiterate some of the things that um, Ms. Borowski has said. I have loved being on this committee. I have learned so much. I have shared so much, um, gained so much from all of the people that I've worked with. Um, and the presentations have uh, amazed and wowed me. And the role of our teachers are just amazing. Um, but I, too, after months and months um, of discussions with my family and um, my internal self have decided that I won't put my, um, I won't pull papers for this next election. Um, my signs will stay in my attic. Um, I, but I think that um, there's a lot I want to do and I can't do everything. And when I do want to do it, I want to do it right. And um, so this seems like the right time for me personally to, to not run again. And I, um, it's really hard. It's really even harder to say it out loud. Um, but I think it's the right decision at this time personally. So, but we're not done, and um, we're still here till the election in March, and we have a lot to do. And I plan to be completely involved in that until I'm not. So, and then I will still be <laughs> in different ways. So, I'm very grateful for the opportunity I've had. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. That's what I was going to say. Oh, all oh, right. Absolutely. Well, she can second. You can second it. I second it. All those in favor. All right. Thank you.